live. Hopefully, you guys are hearing us. Yeah, so you can, I am. Oh, yeah, tough luck. Yeah, let us know if you're not hearing us. Um, oh, Shad is there. Hey, Shad, how's it going? Um, oh, 11 people on. All right, let's yeah, go. Uh, so, yeah, I'm here with Ryan Cahill, author of The Bound and the Broken. I want to start off. Congrats on your wedding a few months ago, your you. tour to U.S. and U.K. over the last month, and your release of The Ice last week. It's been a bit hectic. It sounds like it. Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, you got a lot going on there. All know. right. So I'm going to start off with a, well, first, just to let everyone know, this interview is going to be mostly focused on the bond and the broken. Ryan's already done a bunch of interviews on self-publishing and writing and That's you can go. Really nice. This is, yeah, this is probably one of the first ones I've done that focuses on the books. Right. Uh, and not just the, um, like the publishing behind it, but yeah. Right. right. So, all right. So to start off with a fairly easy one, where did the idea of the bond and the broken come from? Oh, this has just been something that's been in my head for a very long time. Like, you know, ever since I've been reading, which is the very long time, it was about four. Um, just as, as I'm growing, and as I'm reading more books, this kind of, the concepts always came into my head of something I wanted. And it, the characters weren't there, but the kind of world and the things that I wanted were, were mostly there. And then I think when I started, I, I tried to, I started drawing a map because I, I, I'm a visual person. So like once I kind of mm -hmm. see the world, you know, it, really starts to take hold in my head and then i'm, I'm doing right. i write more of it and as i write more i make the map bigger and i change okay. things and i kept doing that until eventually the world settled in my head because there was always like i have a general idea of the world but what does it actually look like and then after right. a while yeah it, it started to really solidify as i kind of drew the continents and you know got the the factions and stuff out in my head it took a while but yeah it's kind of like a slow burn of just, I don't know, it just came from my, it was just there. The whole time it was there. And then when I got the chance to write, I was like, there's, I was never going to write anything else. Okay. But I will. So you kind of, things, but yeah. So you, before you actually start writing, you built out the world and kind of had it mapped out. Uh, yeah. Did you already know how the story was going to end before you started? More or less. So okay. I always know when I write a book, I always know what the end of that book is. I know what the last line is before I start writing the book. Um, okay. And then for the series, I have like a general, I don't, I don't like to tie myself in too hard. So I have a general idea of how I want stuff to end, but how that actually, and like, it will all change little bits. The ending will be different when I get there. Right. But it's kind of like, I have these goal posts and like, I got to get between them. Okay. But where they land between them. We'll see. Stuff will change. And as I write, maybe a character makes a decision. Like in my head, the way it works is like when I approach these character moments when I'm writing, I kind of go, okay, well, what would this, the whole point of writing on it, what would this particular character do? Thanks, Chad. Right. Uh, looks like we are being told your audio is still a little low. Okay, hold on. I can bring that up nice and easy. Let me see. How's that one? All right. That should be, what I'll do is I'll move also closer and I'll bring this over here. And I'll turn the mic up. So this should work a lot better. Please tell me that's working. Uh, not much better. This they're is... saying not much better. Huh. Hold on. I know what I'll do. This is an easier way to do this. This usually works oh, great. Now they're saying better. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to bring it up again anyway, just in case. How are we looking now? It's sounding better to me. Okay. Okay. Sweet. If, if it does go low or anything, I'll switch over the mic. This usually works fine. It's a great mic. I just I've obviously messed it up a little bit. Let me see. Do -do -do. I was going to say the quality is really good. Yes. Go team. Okay. Do -do. God damn it. Patrick, why are you so loud? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let's see if I can turn myself down. Oh, I might even, because this is a condenser mic, so it shouldn't matter too much, but this should be better now. If not, I'll switch over to the microphone on the computer. 
Somebody tell us, because we don't want to do it. Now it's too loud. We can't damn it, Madison. Oh, no. Yes, I'm just <laughs> okay. All right. So sounds sweet. like we're there pretty we go. good now. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. So kind of a yeah. follow-up question, especially early on in the series, you can see a lot of similarities to other well-known series like Aragon, Wheel of Time, and uh, I would argue the Aragon one is a, is Boy and Dragon, um, right? But yes, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. There's 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 loads. So, was that more of a? Those are just stories you loved, and when you were writing your book, those just happened to be elements you included, or was it kind of like in? I think Wheel of Time. I heard that Robert Jordan said he read Lord of the Rings and thought this is unrealistic. I'm going to write what it's actually like for a farm kid where someone comes and says, hey, come save the world. So yeah, he I think, kind of went into it wanting to rewrite Lord of the Rings. Yeah, no, that that definitely wasn't what I was going for. Um, like for me, there's, there's multiple elements to it. I think there is a fact, there is a factor of that when people read, when, when we do anything to understand things, we like to compare them. That's how humans, human brains right. work. So it's like anything, like when I, I was describing like the Knights of Acheron recently on Twitter, and when I was coming up with them, I was going, okay, yeah, cool. So like, I love the Knights Templar. I've kind of loved the whole idea of them. They're, especially the way they're romanticized. He's like, what if we gave them like space marine power armor and like made the God that they they worship real and tangible and he gives them this armor and they can turn their souls into swords. And, and if someone else goes, um, Knights Radiant, like you stole this from Knights Radiant. I only right. read The Way of Kings last year. So <laughs> it's one of those are, to me, fundamentally, the only similarity is they have a, a cool sword and armor that forms. And that's, right. kind of, that's kind of it. So we grasped that. But at the same time, I definitely, I, when I'm writing that first book, one of the things I did try and do is I wanted to create that same nostalgic feeling that I got. You know, remember when you read those books as a kid, like Lord of the Rings right. and, and Wheel of Time, and you yep. loved them. But for some of them, for me, like like with Aragon in particular, I went back and tried to read Aragon once when I was like 17. I think I read it when I was when I was quite young. And I read it when I was a little bit older. And I kind of, it didn't feel the same to me. And right. some of those books, the magic isn't the same when I went back to read them. It didn't feel that way. And so I kind of wanted to write an adult classic fantasy that when you read it, it gave you those nostalgic feelings you'd hoped you'd have gotten when you went back to read your favorite ones. Right. And I wanted it to be an entry point. I knew where the world was going, but I wanted it to be an entry point as well for people who maybe didn't read fantasy. Yep. So like, for instance, like my wife never read fantasy. So when she read this for the first time, she was able to get, which was really nice for me, she was able to get that nostalgic <laughs> feeling, that real kind of like, oh my God, this is fantasy, this is this, but in an adult area. And that yep. was something I really wanted to do. I wanted to make book one really accessible to people. So a lot of fantasy like that for me they all fall along the same kind of tropes and core tenets. It is, yeah, it's human nature to compare. And that, that's, that's what we do to understand stuff. Um, but they all fall along the same core tropes and tenets. And for me, what makes a story different is how you tell it and the characters in it. So like yes. if you put the characters from The Bound and the Broken in Lord of the Rings or in A Wheel of Time, they'll make very different choices to what Rand makes and what Frodo and Aragorn make. I think that's what's different. There's loads of similarities, hundred percent. I'm I'm very much inspired by those books. Of course I am. I'd be I'd be silly to say I wasn't. I love them right. so much. They like build everything. They're the reason I love fantasy. So especially I'd say in book one, my first book as it's coming out, there's going to be loads more like of those kind of generic tropey things. Some of them will be by accident, and then right. and some of them will be on purpose. Like um, I'll put little homages in, and I, I still do because I love those series. They're amazing. And I will say, when I read um, Of Blood and Fire, you could see the foundation yeah. being laid to, okay, this is starting off similar, but this little thing is different. If he builds off of this, it's going to completely <laughs> go out on its own. And rereading It's great it, to hear that as well. Every one of those that I saw on reread, it's like, Oh, he did build off on that. Yeah, he built off on that. He built off on that one too. But he built stuff... off on all of them. What I tried to do is, like, yeah, it's gonna be reminiscent. It's gonna be tropey. It's gonna be that sort of stuff because I wanted it to have that feeling. I wanted it to have that classic epic fantasy feeling right. that when you read it, you felt at home. And then I wanted to be able to lift off from there and change 
and change it. And what you'll see is I have stuff planned in book four that when you read it in book four, you'll go back to book one and go, that fucking bastard, excuse my French, <laughs> but I do, I curse a lot and I try and tone it down um, when I talk in interviews, but sometimes it goes straight through. Right. Um, but you'll, you'll see these little things that I put in book one that have no significance in book one. And they'll pop up in book one and book two and book three and they seem like they're nothing. And the hope right. is like, if I do my job right, then in book four and book five, you'll realize that none of it was by accident. Right. And that's the hope if I pull it off properly. So we'll have to see. Kind of like uh, Belina making an appearance in book one. That was one of my favorites. That was one of my absolute favorites. And even in the what? fall as well, Farda's name is mentioned. So yes. when it's revealed that he was previously who he was, so we've got to decide if this is spoiler or non-spoiler. I think it probably should be kind of spoilery because then we can have fun and we just tell people it's spoilery. Yep. Um, it is going to yeah, be find... spoilery, but I did phrase most of my questions All right, sweet. where it won't be, oh, this happens at the end of book three and this is what the yeah. big... <laughs> yeah, but a lot of stuff like, like, like with Farda, like you'll see his name pop up in the fall. So yeah. the kind of reveal you get, and I think it's like book two, where you find out what his past really is, was actually already there. Right. But a lot of people didn't click the name link and uh, stuff yes. like that. Like, but there's, there's even smaller things that I can't wait. I'm really excited for. Since I, uh, so I started to do a reread of the whole series not too long ago, like the last month or two. Yeah. And I was reading, rereading the fall. And I think it's part three. Um, yes. I can't remember That's her corn. name. That's but part three is yes, corn. corn. Yeah. And you finish it. I'm like, well, what happened to corn? And this is yeah. after I've already read the whole series. And then I get through book two reread. I'm like, there she is. It's like, nah. Yeah. I was wondering what happened. Yeah, so I've tried to do that in loads of little pieces where all these things and people crop back up and mix. And I want to make it, one of the decisions I made is I really wanted to make it reread rewarding. So not everybody rereads books and series. Right. But for the people who do, I wanted there to be loads of little things that they'd start yes. to notice. Um, because like, I don't know, I, I just love that. I love that when I read the older books and the more I reread right. it, the more I saw these little pieces that maybe meant nothing, these small lines. Like, I don't know if you notice, so this is it. This isn't, isn't a spoiler, um, but in, in the ice. So I'm not gonna reveal any plot element about the ice because I know it's a new book. But right. you, you see um, at the point where like in the start of a blood and fire working, I guess the, the end of you, you see that link. And um, one thing that I, I was asking a few readers if they noticed was when when they land there and they're, they're right at the end and Aeson says, we have to go and talk to, to Darda, um, Darda Vastian. In book one, Darda Vastian is the shipping guy who Kaelin is bringing the weapons to from his dad. So the idea is that we never realized it, but from the very start, from before book one, Kaelin was talking about how his dad would ship weapons and the Empire wouldn't pay for them. But what that reveal actually shows is his dad was always contributing to the rebellion, even when we didn't right. think he was. So Darda Vastian, it was revealed then the cart that they have at, in book one that they go off on with the egg. Okay. He's the guy who left it for them. And then he's also the guy who the weapons were going to. And he's the guy who's sending weapons to the north to Corin. And it was Kaelin's dad who was providing the weapons. Huh. But Nobody I did not put all that together. <laughs> so it's these small little lines that for me, like if you're rereading and you go through and you can go, right. oh, cool. And so that's been something I've been waiting to do. I've been waiting to put that line in so people could connect the dots. Okay. But yeah. Yeah, I did read Of War and Ruin. Then I start my reread. And I think I finished Of Darkness and Light and then read The Ice. Yeah. So... So I didn't go back to a there's, there's a lot of words and a lot of books and yes, and like that's it gets. I kind of made like the first book single POV, not single POV. There's yep. a few small little ones, but I did it. I did it like very intentionally. One because I didn't think I was good enough at that stage to do multi POV properly, and that's why the fall has four POVs because I wanted to practice POV strength as well. Okay. Um, and then I was able to apply that for darkness and light. So I went. I knew my craft needed to get better. So I wanted to like focus, but then I also wanted to make it accessible for new readers so that they weren't having their head thrown around and right. then introduce more POVs in a darkness and light and then really start to bring in the stuff that I wanted when you hit to a war room. Yep. I was uh, talking to Dom not too long ago about how oh, yeah. there's 
in my view, there's two ways to do multi POVs. There's the, here's this person. And now we're going to jump to this other person and then jump to this other person or what I call the tree and branch method. You start with one person who introduces you to the next POV and then you just branch off from them like you did in a blood and fire. And it's so much easier for me to get into a story when it's done that way. There, there's a thing that I kind of call um, like narrative resonance. So switching POVs from a craft perspective, it's it, when you do something that like George R. Martin does and you have the names at the top and you, you switch it in a continuous order, that's one way of doing it. But if you're doing it in a flow style, using narrative resonance can make it really easy for a reader because at the end of each chapter, you should be linking to who the next right. POV is going to be. And yep. there's those kinds of things. And there's a couple of times where I break that. Um, and one of them is with the introduction of Dane uh, yep. in book two. And I do that on purpose because I want to bring him in, have the curiosity about him. And then this, the next book is the exile. Yep. So there's things like that where I break it, but I break it for a reason. And then it kind of goes, oh, who is this dude? And then you see all the stuff and you get the exile next. And that really preps you for what you're going to see in A Born Ruin with Dane as well. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Which the Exile is easily the best novella I've ever read. Ah, the, so. the, I I don't usually get a chance to talk about the books properly, like from a from a craft and like a reading perspective. So it's it's just really nice to hear that. I loved writing the Exile. The Exile was really fun. Um, there's been times where the, people have obviously they're big books, and not necessarily wanting to commit to it. Um, it's like you know what. Just start with the exile. I've, it's not the ideal situation, but if you're hesitant, yeah, go ahead, pick up the exile, and after that, tell me you don't want to read the series. It's kind of the thing for me where I think if someone tells me they love the blood and fire, I'll usually be able to go, okay, you're going to like the series. Yes. Right, because that's where I think people who are more hardcore fantasy readers will wobble because it has more tropey stuff there's always going to be tropes because right. basically a trope is just a trope is just like a, a tenet of a genre that you don't right. usually like or you've seen a lot that's all when people say tropey they just mean oh well i've seen this kind of style of something a lot but it's usually there like it's part of what makes a genre a genre so right. i think it's really if you're a like especially if you're a reviewer or something like that because i think we lose the kind of the separation between people just being readers like you know, you don't have to be a reviewer. You can just right. like books. And a lot of people just like books. And for the same reason that like the romance genre is so massive is like romance genre is like it's copy and paste cookie cutter plots. But then the difference is how amazing they are with characters. Like if you want to find out how to write good characters, you read romance books. Because if you can get people to keep coming back and reading the same essential plot time and time again, right. it's because your character work is fantastic. Yeah. And it, it's that kind of stuff. It's separating it, like understanding that tropes can be a great thing. And that's kind of what you love about a genre. Yep. Speaking of tropes, specifically dragon riders. So oh, yeah. animal companions are like beloved in fantasy. Uh. But dragon riders, they hold their own special place. So I have yeah. two questions for you. One, what makes the dragon rider relationship different than an animal companion relationship? Yeah. And why are dragon rider relationships held in such a special place in our hearts? Well, I think there's I think it's kind of the same reason. I think that they're not real. So it's this special, amazing thing in the same way that you kind of wished, like I wished as a kid that when I turned 10, I'd become a, a Pokemon trainer. Right. Because it was never going to happen. And it, it's this magical fantasy. Whereas like, you know, you, you see like the wolf, like people bonding with the wolf and stuff and you go, and that's amazing. It's so cool. Wolves are real. And I know they don't do that. Right. Whereas, which it's still amazing to see, but then with yeah. dragons, because they're just this special, fantastical creature, they're symbols of especially depending on how you write them. So like they're written very differently. Like if you look at, you have, you have, you have Aragon, which is a lot of kind of like what the, the YA introduction for a lot of people is. You have Anne McCaffrey and the way she writes it. You have Naomi Novik and Temeraire, which is the way she writes it. And they're very different. And like, I know for me, like when I'm writing my ones, it's this idea of, 
combining what we love in the animals that we love. So like people love dogs and wolves and it's that keen, keen intelligence while still being beast like for me when dragons talk it loses a lot of that kind of the power to me i don't know why it just it loses that like even in aragon that was something that never sat right with me when it, when they could think and speak to each other in their minds um because it just i don't know it took away that, that mystical nature but so what i love about it is yeah it's that dragons are this incredible symbol of power and it's one thing that's never touched on in books which i tried to touch on in my books is what the hell does a dragon get out of it why would a right. creature of such immense power and incredible, like just epicness, want yep. to do, want to bond with a human? Why? Right. So I think when a book answers that question, it creates this really kind of like, I don't know, it, it almost makes it more real. Like, and I think that's, yeah, that's what I love about it. And it holds such a special place in my heart because it's just this amazing fantasy thing. It's like the, it's the, the epitome of that epic fantasiness. For me, I don't know. There's probably much better ways of describing that, more articulate ways of describing it. But um, it's just something. It's just so special. It's so different to to real life. It is right. Yeah, it's the escapism that you you want from fantasy. It's just so unique. It literally lives entirely in your head. Boundary exactly, and it, it 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 provides that extra gap of escapism. Whereas like bonding with other animals, animal companions are amazing and they're incredible to have, especially in books. It, because people love animals. We love our dogs, we love our cats right. and that sort of stuff. So it's their basic. And then you increase it to a new fantasy level when you're like bonding with wolves and stuff. But when you bring it to the next level where it's a creature that doesn't exist, I don't know, it opens doors that other real animals don't open, I think. Okay. Personally, I think yeah, dragons are just this international symbol of, of power and strength and wisdom, like this ancient kind of knowledge. Um, which adds to an epicness of it like in all the different cultures you know like chinese like asian east asian culture european culture they're always kind of symbols like that of power strength and ancient knowledge yes oh well, yeah all right good answer uh, long answer sorry <laughs> hey, no i'm all for it um uh, and then another question you kind of mentioned aragorn or aragon yeah, yeah aragorn earlier and one of the defining things about him is there's no toxic masculinity with him yeah he is a strong character but still a loving character yes and so many of your characters in this world are like that yeah was that intentional or inspired by anything or completely intentional and um, very 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 heavily intentional and it's quite funny because i've actually gotten and this this shows this shows why like for me why i feel like i was right to do it is i've actually gotten multiple emails where people asked me if like half the cast are gay like if the male cast are gay because because and i don't know it's like it's like there's something really homoerotic about it or something i'm like they're just caring for each other they're just right. showing and i think showing positive male male relationships to me is like really important i think yeah i'm definitely inspired by the way token deals with it token is like it's weird okay so like people always have this idea with token when we look back at fantasies and how they're kind of when you take them out of time how they don't apply with the sensibilities that we have nowadays um and i think token really does the only thing where it's different is with different races and like when people we have people from different ethnicities who might not be um represented in token's work but again i think a lot of that is just where he grew up a lot of white people right. around them so he wrote yep. that way but the sensibilities he writes with were way ahead of his time like you deal with the the bonds between frodo and sam and the way sam carries frodo and loves frodo and takes care of frodo and the way aragorn is willing to be this powerful guy uh, i love yeah that's it. seeing those kind of things are amazing um thank you joe because because that's that's what it is it's like he's this powerful strong guy who is like a legendary warrior and he just completely shows that vulnerability. And but for me, a lot of it came from seeing stuff like that. And then also like, like my parents, the way I was raised, like my dad always raised me to, to kind of show emotion and be vulnerable and talk when I'm, when I'm struggling. And so like with some of my closest friends, that's how I would deal with stuff. Like if I see that something's wrong, I won't just like have a drink and walk on that day. I'll, I'll say, are you okay? And then right. when they go, yeah, fine. I'll be like, no, no, actually, Right. Like, I'm not like saying it to be like, hi, I want to know where right. you are, right? Because you don't, it doesn't seem like you are. Um, and so that's something I really wanted to represent when I wrote the books, because 
to me, that's how humans should be. That's not like exaggerating something. Like if you go into this to level, like with Kaylin and Veril and Eric and Dan, and you go through these kind of struggles um, with each other, you you go through that kind of war. I've never experienced war, but I can imagine I've, I've done other things um, with emotional scope and I've seen how they kind of bonded me to my friends. Right. And so you go through those kind of hardships, you know, that kind of support system it, it's actually um it's something that i do i don't know if, if you would have noticed it or if you noticed it but so i use between damon and kaylin i use the two of them as a foil so you take damon and kaylin are essentially two young men who are struggling in the shadows of their fathers um, and struggling to to move forward they've both lost their family they're both thrust into a situation that they are absolutely not ready for and um, with loads of people looking to them to make the right decisions. And the difference is Kalen has a support network and Damon doesn't. And Kalen actually takes Damon's best support network, which is Tarman. And yeah. you can see where Tarman and Kalen have what I call Anakin Skywalker moments. So where if Tarman isn't there, Kalen would have become Darth Vader. Right. And so I have these moments where Tarman is Qui-Gon Jinn to me and um, when I write these books. So what would have happened to Anakin if Qui-Gon never died? So that's the way I look at Tarman and Kalen's relationship. And you're seeing you take Qui-Gon Jinn away from Damon and he makes every wrong decision he possibly could and is led by his right. emotions. And so that's how I looked at that dynamic and kind of I wanted to introduce that and show that and have those Anakin Skywalker moments where Kalen if left, was going to make the decision to kill someone, was going to make the decision, and he would have. So that's one of the things I like with that. Caleb's right. one of the, like the main protagonist, but he's he tries to do the right thing, and he tries to, he has that not like nobleness instilled by his father, but he's a human, and he will right. make wrong decisions, and he is willing to kill people if he needs to. Yeah. So having someone like Tarman there is that support network that Damon doesn't right. have. And right. having those male male relationships where they're willing to talk to each other, I think is really important. And I think it's like it's an influence on readers too. For me, like I want to try and change that culture in real life. So that's the smallest way I can do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So I'm my... that comment. <laughs> right. Um, so how do you? And you've kind of all right touched on this a little bit with that answer. Yeah. How do you build character growth in these characters that already start off with a strong moral compass? I think it's because character, strong moral compasses don't define whether your character can grow. So, like, that's one part of the character. But I think one of the key things is ensuring it's the same thing that allows you to have complex human characters, that they all have flaws. And not just one, but they have multiple and they all have specific flaws. So when I write characters, I want to make sure that it's not just this person is an alcoholic and that's his flaw. Right. So like when I look at Kaylin, like one of the things right now, Kaylin, one of Kaylin's flaws, especially as he starts and one of his growths is he has a strong moral compass. He's a very strong moral compass. And, but also that leads to him having a flaw. So Kaylin for me is a character who is willing to die to save his friends. He is willing to die. There is no, no right. who or what about it. He will do that. And he will stand up for his friends no matter what. And he will drag himself through fire to make sure any of his friends are okay. But he will also make the wrong choices to do that. Yep. And that makes him a flawed character. And it's why in A War and Ruin, when people kind of turned on Aeson for making his decisions, Aeson to me, and it, it was really important to me to get this right, is that Aeson's choices needed to be logically understandable, even if you don't agree. So Aeson made the right choice in preserving the war effort and preserving being able to take down the Empire. If he did not make that choice, the chances are Caelan would have died. He would right. have gone north, he would have been torn apart, and that's it. And Aeson saw this point of view where he's seen Caelan literally leave everything and chase Rist. And that was that thing, as I always see these stories where, you know, you have the reluctant hero at the start, but then like, you know, he goes, I'm going to save the world and I'll do anything to save the world. I'm like, no, a real human wouldn't do that. A real right. human would go, yeah, I'm going to save the world, but like, 
this is my friend. Right. Like, the, one of the only friends I've left in the world. I need to save him. Um, I'm going to go go after him because I don't really know what saving the world is. I'm fucking 19. Like, you know, and I think for me, having those flaws is really important. And like one of Caelan's specific flaws that I built in at the start is he's kind of blurred as to who he is because he's struggling with the loss of his brother and trying to live. He's trying to be for his dad what his brother was. And he struggles with that. And he struggles with not having his brother there to support him when he needs him. Because he leaned on his brother, because he needed his brother. And slowly, part of his journey is accepting that he doesn't need to be his brother, he just needs to be him. And accepting that he has his friends around him to help him and to to talk to him and to listen to him. And that mental health journey and that talk journey is part of his growth. Um, And all the different characters grow in different ways is, is a thing for me. So like, for like instance, for... For Dane, Dane's an, actually not even Dane, Aeson's a better one. So Aeson would be what you'd consider um, a classic archetype, like an epic archetype. So he's a character who you would assume, like Aragorn, who never really changes. So his arc shouldn't be one of growth normally because he's this complete warrior. He is already the guy who knows what he's doing. But his his arc is inverse to Caelan's. Yes. His arc, and that, that's part of it, that's his growth. Yeah. His growth is is learning to trust in others, is learning to to open himself up and to be there because he spent so long on his own. And like, to me, creating those character growth moments isn't just about whether their moral compass is strong. It's not always about learning to be a good person. You know, there's other flaws they can overcome. And again, really long answer, but yeah, I think I kind of wandered in my brain as to where I was going. No, I love that answer. And I was actually going to bring up the relationship between uh, Kaylin and Aeson because it's one of my favorite ones in there. And I think you've used this before that Kaylin was a regular person learning how to be a hero. And Aeson yeah. was meant to be a hero learning how to be a regular person. Yeah, and it's something that um, I haven't really said a lot, but one of the ways I view the series when I write is that it's actually Aeson's story. So if the fall didn't happen, Aeson was Caelan. Right. Aeson was the prodigy. Aeson was the young hero who was coming through the ranks. He was the next big thing. He was the hope of the order. Like Alvira, who was the leader, knew exactly who he was. Like took time to train him, to practice with him. This guy was the next prodigy. He was the guy who was going to lead the Dralid forwards. And then he lost everything. And now Caelan is that resurgence and Kalen is, it's Aeson's story, but Kalen is the one finishing it. Right. And that's kind of how I look at it a little bit. Yeah. I did notice in the fall that Alvira made the comment that she wasn't sure if she'd be able to beat Aeson in a fight yeah. if he was on the other side. Yeah, and that's kind of the thing. He's meant to be, again, I, I, it's one of the things that I've drawn from Star Wars, because I think Anakin Skywalker's um, whole saga his whole life, especially after you watch the Clone Wars and see some other stuff, is one of the most tragic things in fantasy literature. And so I love focusing on this because the Clone Wars, the, the animated series, shows you how much of a legendary warrior he was. Shows you that he wasn't just Anakin, the moody teenager. He was a legend. Like, he was okay. the greatest warrior the Order had. And so for me, I wanted to do a little bit of that with Aeson and show, like, this guy, this is how good he was. And... He's actually, when we meet him in the series, he's broken in more ways than one. Right. And in other ways, he actually has a lot of growth. Not yes. just in personal growth, but in getting back to being as powerful and as strong as he was. Because he's just been like a like an injured animal dragging himself across the world. And so we haven't seen Aeson in the series. We haven't seen him be what he can be. And so it's... The ice touches a little bit on that because his um his kids being in danger is a driving force for him. But yeah, it's that dynamic is something that I want to really push going forward in the series too. Yeah, it's definitely something I noticed more on reread. The amount of times Asen he kind of stops being the Asen you see from Kalen's point of view because yeah. one of his kids are in danger or separated from him. And he doesn't know what's going on with them. Yeah. So he's he's not that steady 
focus on winning the war. He he start he still has that, but he's also my son is in danger right now, and that can't be. Yeah, and it's so. just it's one of those where I think that kind of encapsulates the human being to me, because often even again, if we go back to mental health and we go back to, to suicidal ideations, it's the people who on the outside look put together. The people who on the outside are not showing you that they're suffering. The people on the outside who are not showing you that they're not always happy. And you look at ASIN and from Kalen's, and that's actually a really important thing for me is showing that narrative difference. I think that's how you create three-dimensional characters is by showing them to other people's eyes. So through Kalen's eyes, Asin is this hard ass, like legendary warrior, that kind of stuff. He always knows what's going on. He is like willing to do anything to move forward. But then in the small glimpses you get from Asin's point of view, he is lost and he is broken and he does not know what's happening. And all he wants to do is survive and make sure his children survive. And he will do anything to make sure that they don't have to go through what he went through. And that difference is like really important for understanding the characters and understanding how the series moves forward um strangely enough i saw joe's question there like for me i actually don't i don't think he does in any way i think he understands him i think he understands what it's like to have that weight on his shoulders i think the one of the things you see is i think dallin resents him um, and i think i think um eric doesn't because eric never had the ideations that Dallin had. Right. And it's something that I've, I've tried to slowly bring in. I wanted you, when you read the first bit, to see Dallin as this spoiled little dickhead. And then I wanted you to move forward and understand him. I wanted yeah. to see more from his point of view and understand that everything Dallin ever thought his life was be was taken. Everything he trained for, everything he built, everything he did was gone in one small thing. And he is still young and he's struggling with that. He's like... Perfect my entire life's purpose has just been given to someone else. Yeah. Nobody promised and, it to him, but in his own head, that's what was going to happen. And now his journey is coming to terms with that and finding his own place in the world. Whereas Asin, I think, understands Caelan and Asin is, funnily enough, and you'll see as you go, for me, Asin really just wants Caelan to succeed. He wants Caelan to, to be the best he can be, but he just doesn't quite know how to give that to him. Yeah, that's kind of how I viewed it. And the ice really opened opened my eyes to why uh, Dallin would resent Kalen. Because there you yeah, see and that's more part of the, the small mechanic of, of the ice I wanted to do, yeah. Yes. You you see him before going to the ice and how dedicated he was to the cause and how young they were at that yeah. point. And then everything they go through in at Valacia. So, That's it. You see like okay, literally I, weeks, two weeks right. after, give or take, after those events, he loses his entire life's purpose and right. becomes lost. And yeah. that's what you see like when they go to, to Beldoir, is he he doesn't know what the hell to do. Right. Like where does he go forward from here? I think anyone yep. who has struggled with not knowing where they are in life um, can kind of relate to that. Right. And feeling you have a you have a bigger purpose than what you're achieving. You're meant for something great. It's kind of like you're training basketball your entire life to make the NBA. And if you don't, what the hell was the point in the last 20 years? Right. And, you know, you, you watch the NBA, but do you watch all the players who don't make it? Yeah. Like, and that's one of those things. And you're seeing this and you're going, this guy is like, not only is he good enough to do it, he is more qualified than Kalen. Way more right. qualified. And he right. earned it. He wasn't like yeah. given a silver spoon. Like this guy worked his ass off. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's showing that difference and trying to see how he deals with what's coming forward. Let's see. What is this? Sex for Dale. And he can't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's, that's a big part of it as well. Yeah. Like Dallin, Dallin can't turn to anyone because Asa never promised it to him. Eric is the more compassionate, the more understanding, the more kind of, grounded with his mom's sensibilities and so he doesn't see this he's like he's looking at Kalen going good job Kalen like great right. sweet we have a dragon now and yep. you know Dallin has no one to turn to no one to talk to and that's part of you see the small mentorship with Ivan 
and you see how another thing is the only support network Damon had was Ivan, but it's showing that Ivan wasn't the right support network for Damon, but he was for Dalin, in that a lot of people hated Ivan for what he did, but you know Ivan did have a good core in what he tried to do, but the way different pe different things work for different people and different mentors work for different people and the way Ivan worked worked for for Dallin and he learned a lot from Ivan he learned a lot about being a leader he learned a lot about you know you don't need to be a hero to help people yeah and that's a that's a big thing that's a Ivan is a, plays a huge part in Dallin's understanding of who he wants to be yeah absolutely uh, so the last part of this question which I think the answer is going to be no, but <laughs> today's fantasy is fairly dominated by grim dark. Okay. Did you have any concern that you weren't going to be able to pick up any traction, or you weren't? It was it just gonna, that people were going to put it down because it's not what's in right now? And um, honestly, yeah, no was is the answer to that. So like. I do think as well, I think, especially after book one, but there's bits in book one too. Um, I think after book one, the, the series is quite, it's quite gritty and it can be quite dark. It like, is. Yes. Is in the way I look at it is, someone said the term Grimheart a while ago, and it's the idea for me, what I wanted and part of what makes it adult, like part of what gives it that difference is I wanted things to have the same feel and vibe and kind of story idea as the classic fantasy we like but i wanted it to be like really relatable and understanding and grim in the fact that when these people go to war i want them to be scared like i don't want you to sit there and be like oh yay let's go on an adventure and kill people with swords like i wanted people to feel this like caleb yeah. suffers with what he does and you see dane and dane like actively despises um what he has to do but understands he's really fucking good at it yeah. And it's kind of the thing for me. It, my books were, are never grimdark. I never put it that way because they have there's a really strong underlying current of hope and friendship and, you know, just never giving up. And I think that's a big thing for me. So it was never going to be grimdark. But I don't know. I think if, it was weird because I think for me, I actually came in with a very different perspective. I came in being like, hold on. I, I use this, this analogy a lot. And it kind of felt like being Justin Bieber coming in when pop music was niche like pop music can never be niche how can it be niche right. it's pop because it literally means popular um, right. and so i come in writing classic epic fantasy which is the most one of the most long-serving like the yeah. most long-serving genre because like it's the the you know the forebearer of all stories told around campfires um and somehow it's kind of niche how right. am i one of the only people writing this right now that makes right. no sense so right. as opposed to seeing it dominated by Grimdark, I was more going, I should not have this amount of opportunity. Um, okay. Which is a thing for me. Like, I don't know. I, I came out there and I was going, hey, this has a... Bro it just happens. This is what I love to write. Right. That's why I wrote it. I didn't actually even consider genre. It was like, I want to write this story because I've always wanted to write this story. I want to write like a classic epic fantasy, but I want it to be gritty and real. And I want like, you know, people to understand the weight of what it is to go to war to understand that right. this is not something you can just do. People don't walk away the same humans they entered. Yeah. Like, and I kind of wanted that to be a really core part of the world, kind of lend those so you can find what you want. Cause I think what drew people to Grimdark, the, what is Grimdark is a big, big like, question. Right. Um, but I think what grew, drew a lot of people to Grimdark is that kind of the gritty, like reality of it. Yeah. it's and as well just by the description of it it's it's very emotive like feelings things crunch beneath the, the types of description as opposed to only focusing on the beautiful hills and rivers and skies right it's it's that yeah the visceral nature of what Krim dark is i think really draws people in so i really wanted to kind of capture some of that visceralness um in my story while kind of keeping the the hope and the, the things we go to fantasy for so that was right. kind of always what I wanted, but I wasn't really thinking about what the opportunity was. It was more, I released the book and then kind of went, huh, not many people doing this right now. Well, yeah. Honestly, uh, <laughs> I said, I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm not going to say anything, but 
in my head, like when I sit in a chair and I go, that would be a moment for me too. Yeah. Like that would, cause I love these characters. I like, I don't just write these and to write a book. I, I really love this. This is like so much fun doing this every day. And um, it's stressful. It's one of the hardest jobs I've ever had in my life, but I love it. I love these characters. And I love this world. So like when I think of those kind of meetings, cause I do, I'll always think of even just as a, an exercise, I'll go, what would happen when these characters meet? If they meet, how would they meet? If they meet, what was the, mo- what's the best way to make them meet? And I've had a few things in my head and I go, that would be really cool. <laughs> There's some stuff where I go really cool. Like, Dane's moment, and if you've read, anyone who's read of War and Ruin knows exactly what I mean when I said Dane's moment in of War and Ruin, like the big punch the air epic moment towards the end of Dane's storyline. Um, I had that in my head from the very start of writing. I was like, I cannot get wait to get to this point where he does that, and um, because I don't want to ruin it, um, just in case. But when he does that moment at the end, and he's just like. It's just like one of the most badass Dane moments you could possibly have. Um, and so I think anything Dane does is cool in my head. <laughs> so if he meets Kalen, it's going to be fucking cool. Yeah. I love when people finish the exile and they're like, all right, Dane's my favorite character. And I don't As know he if, should if be. <laughs> I don't know if you notice it because, it, again, it's the same stuff. It, 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 it is a purposeful thing. Like I said, I introduced Dane against the normal narrative structure of how I introduce right. characters. To create that and then the exile comes out straight afterwards and then in a war and ruin i i drill into asin asin's morality asin's purpose and asin's drive and then conflict them against kaelin and then the next book is the ice which yep. is asin's and it's kind of what i want to do it helps from a like a commercial perspective it helps to get people into the novella because they want to know more but it's also a, a craft perspective i want to develop these characters and the best way to do that without slowing the plot down for me is is doing it like this is is creating those intriguing moments and then giving you something about them where you can really really i can dig into asin and dane in the ice in the exile without slowing the main story down and so that's something that i I really like doing yeah and one of the things that separates my favorite series from all the other series is when i can say this is the one thing that they do above and beyond what you typically see. So like Stormlight Archive, the focus on mental health is huge. And oh, that. yeah. So for the bound and the broken, it's the relationships. How how strong or how fragile um, relationships are, are between two characters. And you can pretty much draw a line from any two characters yeah. and have a discussion on just their relationship and yeah they're all it's something that i focus so on unique. when i'm writing and it's really it's it's one of the nicest things to hear stuff like that because it's something that i really focus on and it's what kind of when i'm writing like i love the world and i love all the story and i love like i love the world building it's something i really enjoy but for me when i'm writing it's those character character interactions it's it's thinking what the hell is going to happen when this character meets this character because of what happened with this character and because of what happened here. Like the way the, like, like Aelin or Aelin, Ella and Kaelin's, um, Ella and Kaelin's relationship has the impact of Farda and, and the experience right. that two of them have and how that dynamic completely shifts how the other person thinks. Um, yeah. And then like even an interesting one for me is how Kaelin would, if it were, again, I'm trying to avoid, because books aren't out and aren't written, I'm trying to avoid spoilers of that sort of stuff. But like, if Kaelin were to talk to one of the Dragon Guard, like he did with, with Pelinor, like how that dynamic moves forward now that he's working with Rakina and how their experience with those characters um, would affect what Kaelin can do and the decisions he can make. Um, so that kind of stuff is, I love that. Like I'll sit down and be like, this is the meat of what this story is. Um, you should be able, as far as I'm concerned, whether you agree with any anything a character does should be understandable by their internal logic. If it's not, right. you've broken the character immersion to me. Right. I think characters do it. One character that kills me is Uthred in The Last Kingdom because I love Uthred. He's the most noble, badass, loyal warrior in the world. But then at the end of every 
book or season in the series, he breaks his internal logic to renew the plot. Right. And that annoys the hell out of me. I'm like, dude, <laughs> like you, all you wanted is your whole family. I'm going to leave my family now to swear another oath of allegiance to a king for no reason other than the fact that I am Uthred, son of Uthred. And it just gets... I'm like, God damn it. Because right. I, love, I love the series. I love it so much. And then I hate yeah. that. Ah. Then you say, well, it's interesting how Aeson and Caelan were somewhat at odds. And then the next book is Aeson putting himself through hell. And in an indirect way, it's all for Caelan. Yep. Yep. And... and that's it. Like, but you'll see in, in A Vorn Ruin, like, when they're about to walk into Alora for the very first time and they cross the bridge and he reads the words, like, what Aeson says to Caelan is really raw and open and it is like, Aeson is never at odds with Caelan. He has never been at odds with Caelan. Caelan is at odds with him. And you see Aeson being like, I am, he literally turns to Caelan. He's like, I am trying everything I can. I am doing anything I can to make sure that this works, that you survive and you are safe. Please stop fighting me. And it's like the only point at which Caelan kind of pulls back a little bit. And that's when Caelan kind of realizes that Aeson is not the enemy. He's just, um, you got to be careful of the decisions he makes because he is going to make the decision that will go towards winning this war. Right. And that's just later on when you find out about the secret that he keeps, Caelan's already on track to, to reconciling with Aeson and then you just set him all the way back. Uh, yeah. But it, Aeson is never at odds with Caelan. Even when he makes the decision not to tell Caelan about that secret, it is not because he wants to hurt Caelan. It is actually because he understands Caelan so fundamentally that he knows it's the right choice. And even he was saying... If it was Eric or Dallin, he would have left just the way Caelan would have. Right. And so he knows what he's doing because he would have done exactly what Caelan would have done. Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing I think some people miss in that. Like, um, yeah, Caelan, Caelan, I, I get a lot of messages about Caelan and Risk. Yes. I'll be honest. So of Blood and Fire, the first time I read it, it was what you have even referenced that diehard fantasy readers Yep. are the ones that waffle at that point of it's good but what's new and yep. for me it was this relationship wrist and kale i'm like i need to know how that's gonna unfold and, and like, that was the driving force behind getting me to fairly quickly pick up book two like, and and why while i've been writing like from the very start like i said like, i have a general idea where these stories go all right I've always known where the general ending for the series is going. But I've been open to the characters changing the paths that they walk on. Because that's the fun of writing. Like, to me, if I only had a complete outline for everything and always stuck to it, it wouldn't be fun. So, like, I know where they're ending. I know what's going on in general. But I'm also willing to change those paths. Um, and so, like, many times I've gone back and forth in my head and gone, you know... It's not what will Wrist do. I know what Wrist will do because I know who Wrist is. But what will other characters do? Because when other characters make choices, Wrist has to react to those choices. And when, Kaelin, when other characters make choices, Kaelin needs to react to those choices. So it's not that I don't know what Kaelin or Wrist will do in any moment. It's that I don't know what will happen fully in their story because if something else happens, it will change. So for instance, if someone walks up and tells wrist exactly what happened with his parents you better fucking believe he will walk straight out of there right. and and it's kind of the thing that I, it's really funny when people are going oh wrist is so smart but he's so dumb and how can he believe you you know the empire are the bad guys the empire killed Kalen's parents and i'm like yeah but but that's not how the world works so like right. it, in reality the empire came in okay Kaelin and the Empire were essentially like being a little police force trying to look in the carriage. Okay, they're the they're fighting against the rebels. They go to a cart, they want to look in it. Aeson starts a fight. Kaelin kills one of the soldiers, it's like killing a police officer. Yeah. Like, you come back, the police come to his village. All right, all hell breaks loose. Wrist isn't even there. He's already gotten in and out, and he's on a horse waiting with the other guys. And there's a fight, like between soldiers, you know, and, and, and people are killed. 
But you go to the other side, like, yeah, he knows that. But at the same time, the people that he then meets, and he's very hesitant. He's always hesitant. He's always questioning. He's always trying to find out what's real and what's not. And um, even when he's given all the books, he wants to find out which history is real. He understands that historian, the winner writes history. He understands that if you read certain books, he'll get certain bias. And that's why you'll see when he's looking at the books, he's go, he will literally has a whole internal passage where he's talking about the ones I were able to find that seem reliable based on the history and what was suppressed. And he's like, he literally reads a book because they imprisoned the, the author. So like he's doing it because he knows. Um, but also the people that he meets there are good people. Right. And it's, it's understanding and because that's the thing. And I think especially probably, and this might rub people the wrong way, but I think especially in America, because Ireland's never been to war properly, like in this age, because we we're neutral, we don't really have an army. But when you go to war, the first thing that a lot of people do is you they try and dehumanize the enemy because it is easier to kill something that you don't see as a person. And it's easier to kill a monster. It's easier to believe you're killing a bad person. But that internal logic leads us to believe that everybody in that group is evil. And that's not the truth. Um, it's usually only the most extreme. So Rist also sees that and understands that. The way Rist looks at the world is very different to the way everyone else looks at the world. Rist looks around, he sees good people. And they look after him and they take care of him. He's definitely not sitting there going, I'm loyal to the Empire, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Like, he will jump onto his friends immediately. But... He's finding friends there who care about him. They look after him. They've they've helped him. They've where other people have tried to protect him, the people he's met in the Empire gave him the strength to protect himself. Right. And it's that kind of logic, like with Rist. And that's why I love Rist. I love like it's a totally different story to the other stories. Right. It's a different character and a different journey. And I would sit here talking about this for hours because I just uh this is what drives me to write them. Like so Yeah. And even with the questioning attitude, he even has an internal dialogue at one point, or at least I think he does. Otherwise, I just assume this, that he acknowledges, yes, everyone where I grew up hates the Empire. Oh, but yeah. that's a small town, and I don't know why they hate the Empire and what are their biases. Yep. So he's, he he's trying to come up with a true truth and not let other people's opinions so yeah 100 percent, and that's the way he looks at the world and it's why like so again i'm not going to ruin anything but you know when when fane comes to him all right yep. and he talks in the library so i'm not going to say whether fane is good or bad or anything else people always have their opinions i will say that you know he is and you'll see it's it's alluded to with um with tivar when he she talks to caelan that Fane is a master at understanding people. He knows what to do, what to say. Some people say it's manipulation. Other people, it's just he's very charismatic. It just depends. But he knows how to get people to do what he wants. He understands them. And you'll see when he approaches Rist, it's not by chance. It's not uh, out in a garden. It is where Rist feels comfortable, in a library, surrounded by books, and the argument that he gives him is not do as you're told, it's educate yourself. Right. He gives him, he understands Wrist. He understands that Wrist works off logic. He understands that, how does he get Wrist on his side? He lets Wrist read the books. He, right. he, he explains what's going on. He knows that if he can sway Wrist's internal logic, Wrist agrees with him. And he knows if he bullshits Wrist, Wrist will see right through it. So, like, and that's the, the thing, the, one of the big dynamics between the gods and with Fane is that what's true and what's not. And we don't know that yet. And that's kind of the thing. It's kind of what I wanted to set up is that you, you read your first book in Blood and Fire and you get your general evil empire, good people, evil god, good god. And then as you go through it, you realize that maybe just as we're not understanding Wrist sees maybe the history isn't written the right way maybe it is and that's kind of yeah it's something that i really like I, I love i love i love that i love someone who understands wrist in that world he understands how he thinks and so that's how he talks to him and when you look at wrists wrists um point of view chapters you'll notice that like if you look at it properly is that you look at a set of kalens all right and what he focuses on he focuses on his friends he focuses on valeris he focuses on that sort of stuff 
With Dane, he always has internal thoughts. When Dane's going through his point of view, he always has his internal thoughts on himself as a character and, you know, whether he believes himself to be a good man. And that's a focus on Dane's narrative. And then with Wrist, it's always rambling. Like he, when he, when I write his stuff, it's always him randomly thinking of weird shit that's everywhere. He's talking to Nera, going to meet battle mages, and all he could think of is how the fuck the goat got up there. And that's like, that part for me, although it seems really innocuous and like a gag, that's a, a flag to how Wrist's brain works. So he's walking and he can't focus on certain things. And then when he does, he hyper focuses on that thing. And it's, it's something that I love playing with when I'm writing. It's trying to trying to make sure the actual chapter is written differently. Like the way the prose flows is different. That makes sense. But, yeah. Uh, Again, so very long since answer. we're <laughs> talking about wrist, I wasn't going to bring this up till later because it's a little bit spoilery. So okay. we might get our first raffo on this one as well. Oh, potentially. So trial of, or, yeah, trial of will. Almost definitely going to be a raffo. But okay. continue. But continue, continue. <laughs> The question, I had a couple questions around it. The first one was, it seemed very propaganda-y, propaganda-ish. Um, are they all like that? Or was this something set up special just for risk because of who he is? So um, what I'll say is, in general, yeah, read and find out, um, but in general, they are meant to orchestrate the toughest situations for your brain to ever deal with and what you would do in those situations. So that's kind of the trial. It's a trial of will in that. Do you have the will to push past what you want? Um, so I will, I will not comment on whether something's been influenced in it, whether it's not been influenced in it whether he saw what they wanted him to see or he saw what he needed to see or whether it's true or whether it's false. Cause that's kind of the, the thing is for you to have that in your head. Right. Um, and I think they're important in series, those kind of gaps and those no answer points, that's what creates you thinking. And if yeah. I answer that question, you don't you no longer think about it. Right. Um, and so that should be something that will drive your thoughts when you go forward, when you're reading is like, is it true? Is it not? And that should be what impacts how you're thinking of what risk does. Um, but in general, those, those trials are made for a reason. Like they're made that way. Um, it is made to challenge, like for instance, like the trial of will is made to challenge your strength of will and your resolve to do what needs to be done. Right. And then the trial of faith that he goes through as well, which is a totally different type of trial is is faith and belief that what you're doing is right and the people around you will support you um and it shows that kind of because faith in general the difference between faith and will is is apparent in that and the faith is kind of it's kind of faith is almost inherently blind faith because almost all faith is is blind faith um and that's kind of the idea behind that one so my other question i think you kind of answered that was was his trial fairly representative of what was done before the fall because they say that this is a tradition that goes back to before the fall, that there is a trial of will. Yes. So and that I was I just wondering answer, if it's and, been and tampered yeah, it with is. 400 years. So in general, the, the whole structure of it, again, I'm not going to reference about whether it's something's tampered or something's not tampered, because even if it isn't, even if it isn't tampered with or it is tampered with, like once I answer it, it changes it. But right. um, the general trial is very much representative of what always used to happen. Because the idea being when you teach someone to utilize the kind of destructive power that the battle mages are trained in they need to have the ability it's not like the jedi where you strip away all emotional attachment but you need to have the ability to see past what you want you need to see the ability to do the thing that's right um and so that's one of the trials that was brought up like that way and part of that is influenced by um by the Angrial in wheel of time yeah. Um, and it's the thinking. idea, but that that's also it's if that's also influenced by trials throughout all cultures throughout history, um, and that's the thing. I think a lot of times, especially if you read Robert Jordan or read someone else, we're like, oh my god, this guy created everything. Like, but you realize that actually he took. If you actually read any of Ronnie Verdi's or Verdi's uh, tweets, um, Ronnie's uh, amazing. He wrote the first binding, but his he is one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever met in my life. But he has entire deep dives on how basically like. 
so much of the mythology in Wheel of Time is taken from South uh, East, I think it's East Asian or South Asian um, mythologies and history. Like even literally the concept of the Wheel of Time is like right. a South Asian concept that he has taken quite directly, um, but he made it his own. And that's what's yep. important with fantasy. Um, Rachel's, oh, I love Rachel. Rachel always writes these, um, Rachel's kind of read the series for a long time and she writes these amazing reviews on Goodreads. And I tend not to, I don't want to read too many reviews because I also don't want, I don't want reviewers to feel like you're over their shoulder. Um, I don't think that's fair. I think I think right. I want viewers to, to feel like readers who, because they are readers, who want to just leave reviews. But um, Rachel was there for a long time. And obviously now and again, I look, and especially sometimes if I need a boost, I'll just go and filter by five stars because, <laughs> man, did. But it's one of those, you get amazing four-star reviews, amazing three-star reviews. But if you're mm -hmm. having a bad mental health day and you see a bad one, right. I might not write for a week. I can't afford to do that. My schedule's too tight. So, <laughs> so I'll filter by it because I want all those reviews and I love all those reviews. But like sometimes a mental health just needs to see a good one, yeah. Um, and so I'll go yeah. on, I'll go on the five star, and it's, I see Rachel's. Rachel is one of the few who, regardless, I will read the review every time she puts it up because she just has so much passion when she writes these reviews about the series. I love reading it; it gets me fired up. So I read the reviews, and I'm like, I'm gonna go right now. <laughs> like, and it's there's there's some people there's a, there's a handful of people who leave those reviews out there, um, and it's like when you left that message in the Discord as well. That kind of stuff when i feel like the story is connecting with someone and um, or it's helping someone in any way and it really connects deeply with them that gets me real kind of like i'm gonna i need to write more like i love that so much it's like this feedback loop when i think it's one of those where some people just want to write stories but i actually i really want people to read my stories not from a financial perspective but because that's that feedback that i love like i love talking right. like you can see now like you it's hard to shut me up so we're talking about this series and I just, I love it so much. I love writing it that when I hear it really helps someone or affects someone, it like gets me really amped to write more of it. Yes. Yep. Which... And I didn't even like comment on amazing female characters. Um, <laughs> and there's an interesting one. Thank you for acknowledging that, by the way. I, I love all the characters, but like, I, I love writing. Like there's so much complexity in my head to like Belina and, and Alina, which is really funny. That is one that I am... Um, I, you know, I don't know if you think the term called hanging a lantern on it um, at the end of, of War and Ruin when the both of them meet each other and they realize how similar their names are. Oh, yeah. that, was a, that was a joke, an internal joke that I made when people started commenting. They were like, oh, you have too many characters with the same first letter. And I was like, I was like, there's only so many letters in the alphabet. And there's like 500 named characters. Like I could only reuse it so much. Right. So I had to make that joke. But um. Yeah, it's something that I really wanted to, to focus on, I think, when I'm writing uh, female characters in it, is I just want them to be complex humans. And I think it's a difference in sometimes we get lost in writing characters where I don't want to write a female character where I'm writing the experience of what it is to be female, because I don't understand that. Right. But I can write a female character who's a complex human being. I just I'm not going to deal with what it is to be a woman because I don't know that and I'm going to write that poorly. Um, but I wanted, I always wanted to try and do this. And there was um, one moment when I was writing that my proofreader, Taya, she said something to me and it stuck with me till this day. And to me, it's one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given for life and for writing. And um, she said, challenge your default. And the reason she said that was because she's like, look, she, said, she was proofreading book two, book two. Yeah. And she was like, you have loads of like strong female characters in this. Um, and loads of strong male characters, all the different stuff. But if you notice, every time we meet um, a military leader who is like generic, every time we meet like a captain or we meet like anyone else who's not like a main character, they're always male. And she was like, I don't know whether that's because of just inherent bias, whether it's because you're, you're male and you're thinking that way and that's the way it works, um, or that's the way it's always been in fantasy. Um, but if it's clearly not on purpose, it's a, it's a default setting. So from now on, when you think something, challenge that default. Um, and that really led me to kind of going, wow, it's so, so small, but for everything in, in life, it really kind of applied, it made a difference. And especially when I was writing, because I noticed it, I noticed that my default was that captain was a dude. And I, right. she's like, you've built a world. She, she's like, you have built a world where men and women are like, in armies everywhere they fight like they like they do like they do yeah. with the vikings all over the place yeah every time you go to make this person they're a man 
So like, it's not about like misogyny or, you know, trying to hit quotas. It's like, look at real life. Like the reality is you have put an equal amount of women in your armies. There really should be more of these people cropping up. And I was like, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. I really need to challenge that. Um, and that made a huge difference for my writing going forwards from like a, just a broadening the world, like in a right way, like not like a diversifying quota way, but in like a, this is literally what it should be. You should write it this way. Right. This is what the world is. And um, so that's a little tangent, but that was just an interesting piece that Taya said to me. Um, but I really, I really love when someone says that they've seen this kind of like strong female characters who aren't just like, just badass women who are like doing what men would do. Right. Like who are doing different stuff as well. So that's, that's really cool. Which I never thought about that as far as the just random characters kind of having them equal out. And now that I'm thinking about it, like I can see that you have done that. And so yeah, so it's one of those things two, that the whole way through from book two, because that's when she said it. So during the edits, I made sure to apply that from book two yep. um, to have it going across. It was specifically like the the scene that popped into my mind was from the exile when Dane is he's been arrested and there's two people looking over him trying to get answers from him. One's a guy, one's a woman. And it's like, oh yeah, but it, but it's, it's not even like it's one of those where it's not a thing. I think if you right. don't linger on it, if, if the narrative doesn't linger on the fact that it's equal or the right. fact that it's like that, it's just like, they're just people. They're here and that's exactly. what it is. That, and you don't that question made it, it so much better that I didn't notice it until you brought it up. There, it, there's an interesting, an interesting thing that just, it just tangents onto this a little bit. So one thing that I, I've gotten um, a couple of emails about uh, is the fact that I use the word there. Okay. Um, in the singular. So, People are like, oh, well, you're in a fight. And say they're in the battle, the battle of the three sisters um, in the War and Ruin. And Wrist is fighting. And, you know, he says, the elf fell, you know, um, their legs cut from beneath them or whatever. And we talk about it in the singular. And I got an email recently and someone was like, you know, I really love the books, really love all this. But, you know, there's one thing that makes me cringe a lot. You use the singular word there. Or use the, the word there for singular descriptions. Um, I know nowadays we use it for non-binary people, but like, I just don't think it's right here. Like it's not on purpose. And I was kind of going, look, what you got to understand is the singular of there has been used in all of history. It's, it's part of the English language. Okay. So you say a woman heard someone blow their nose. That's singular. Right. Okay. And it's usually used in a situation where you do not know the gender of the subject. Right. All right. So I saw a, a hooded figure walking behind me they move to their left, they move to their right, right? It's That's what it is. So when you're in a, in a battle and someone's wearing a helmet, you can't tell if they're a man or a woman. To me, it's a narrative flaw that a character can tell because they shouldn't be able to tell in the world I've created because there's both men and women in the battlefield. And what we're used to is a standardized structure that women don't fight in war. And so when you go to these other classic fantasy series, the, the pronoun he is used all the time because you can make the assumption that everyone you're fighting is a man. Right. But when you introduce a world where there's women and men, and like with the Vikings or anything else, you have men, women and men fighting, and you can't tell the gender, it's a, it's a flaw for the character to know. And I think they put one time where, where Eric is coming up behind um, Fritz, and Fritz is in the forest and he's trying to kill Caelan. And Eric says like... Um, the figure moved like their hood going this way or the cloak going that way. And so like, you know, he should have said he, cause it was Fritz. And I'm like, yeah, but all he could see was the back of a hood in a dark forest. Right. So if he said he, that's actually, that's a flaw because I've jumped out of Eric's head and gone to an omniscient narrator who now knows that they're he. Yeah. So it's one of those where we're so ingrained to all figure, all threatening figures in books being men that we always say he and the reality is we actually shouldn't know so it's one of those that like i, I decided to do when i was writing the series because like it actually made no sense to me when i was realizing how i write like i'm writing from a third person limited perspective so i should only have eric's point of view in that scenario so for him to know that's a he he must have x-ray vision right. um, 
so it's just a small thing to tangent onto that because I only got I only got an email like that maybe two days ago and I read it and I was like, yeah, that's not true, right? Yeah. Which, going back to something you said when you were talking about the wheel of time and stealing from history, I was in an, a call with Michael J. Sullivan. Uh, oh yeah. Starter call, and he was saying how he mostly reads nonfiction because he can plagiarize nonfiction and turn it into fantasy. Yeah, but George if he reads other fantasy, yeah. it will influence his fantasy too much and become too similar. So he sticks yeah. with nonfiction. George R. R. Martin's whole series is based around wars in England. His it, the, the fucking Westeros is Ireland and England turned upside down. Like yeah. so, but. That's the point. I think the point that I make isn't that these people are stealing. It's that like it doesn't matter. Like the story right. that we're reading is about how these characters work in the world. Yeah. Like so that's the point. Like Jesus, if we stopped doing stuff that was there already, we'd never write anything. I have people who be like, "Oh, you can't use that name. This character in this book is called Harry." Like, what? Right. But with the amount of fantasy books in the world, like, do, <laughs> if yeah, we stop using things that are used already. <laughs> I actually heard a writing technique to like for teaching yourself how to write and I'm not a writer, so I don't know how good advice this is, but if you're stuck, just start writing your own story, write about your life and then throw a fantastical element in it. And there you go. You just throw the fantasy story. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Like it's, it, it all depends on what you're trying to do. So like, if it's just like, just to write anything, hundred percent. Um, but it's just, yeah, I don't know. Like it all depends on what you're trying to do at that time. So like when I'm trying to write a scene and say I have, um, like for instance, a big one is this did again, the battle of the three sisters, um, uh, in a worn ruin and you have the shifting POV where you shift between El Tuar and wrist and El Tuar and wrist and, and fired as well. And I am very purposely showing a huge gulf in understanding between a character who has fought wars for 400 years and a character who has been trained very heavily but is then thrown into absolute chaos and that exercise for me that's an exercise i always do is when i approach a scene i try and that i'm, that I'm maybe struggling with i try and throw some of the other characters into that scene in my head what would they do because if you go into that battle, Wrist is going to do something very different to what Farda will do. He'll do very something very different to what Ella will do. Something very different to what Dane will do. And the way they fight and the way they'll see the world will be different. Like, Wrist is going to trip over the fallen limb that Dane will not trip over. Like, Wrist is going to make the bad decision on conservation of energy that Dane is not going to make. All right. And it's those kinds of things that are very, very, very different. And there's actually, I alluded to it in a conversation that Dan had with Kalen, and where Dan says, you know, all of this started with a mantle. The day this story started was the day that Kalen realized that Eric left his mantle in the bar. And he brought that out and that's when he found the Empire soldiers. And Dan saying, if that was me, I probably would have just got drunk. Okay. And we wouldn't be here. And if that was wrist, he might have picked it up and looked at it and tried to find out what material it was made of. Right. You know, the story only happened because Kalen found it. Yeah. And that to me is the difference in that. That's a really good character exercise is trying to find out what different characters would do in the same chapter. And then that helps inform you of what the character you're writing would do. Right. But something that I find very fun anyway, it works for me. Yeah. That kind of leads to this next comment about what Asen, what was going through his head when the dragon hatched in book one and it's like well yep you could relive that moment from Asen, kaylin eric dallin everyone experienced that moment totally different opinions it's like, yep there's it actually this comment reminded me of a scene in the marvel movies tony stark makes a joke during a serious point no one laughs because it is serious. But then later on in one of the Spider-Man movies, when that same moment is shown, there's a whole bunch of laughter. Yeah. Because the person, his memory, he remembers being made fun of and everyone laughing at him. 
it didn't happen, but that was how he experienced it. Yeah. And I can just imagine everyone experiencing this, that moment differently and remembering it differently. But that's it. Asen is kind of watching the culmination of 400 years of work. Dallin is right. watching his dreams collapse. Dan is going, what the fuck is happening here? <laughs> And you have totally different, like, and that's the way it should be. Like, if, if you if character work is done right, um, and which I hope it is when I'm writing, then that's how it should be. That's, you should be able to tell. Like, if I'm in that scene, I'm telling you about that scene, and I said, one of the characters is watching 400 years of work happen. One of the characters is watching their dreams collapse. One of them doesn't have a fucking clue what's going on and just wants a drink. <laughs> you should know who I'm talking about. Right. Um, yeah, I'm just reading Joshua's comment. Yeah, that that's that's exactly it's it's something that really stuck with me is challenging how how you think. Yep. Because it doesn't mean writing the way you're writing doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. But your story will be richer if you challenge your default setting and understand that there's other ways to do things and that there's other stuff going on. Your story is gonna be more complex if you do that. Long time. Yep. Yeah, I, I honestly do, I don't have enough research into it to know, but I would very much agree. I can't imagine it's not that way. Um, but it, it it is also like especially from um from a battle point of view, from a war point of view, an army's point of view, when you're introducing captains and soldiers and generic people, all the fantasy that we would have read, not all the fantasy, but the vast majority would have been like the men fight while the women stay at home. Like the only instance you're, you're the ale in the wheel of time, but even that, it doesn't have the balance. It has a full swing. You have the maidens of the spear who they're like the Amazonians um, and they're defined by war. So which, which again you have in like um, in Valtara. So you have like the wyvern riders who are only female. Now I, I introduced very specific logistical reasons why they're the only ones who are there. Like the wyverns are smaller and structurally wouldn't be able to fly with heavier people. Um, but, there's a lot going on there. Um, so there's so many things that contribute to that kind of bias and kind of that generic male character. Um, yeah, hundred um, percent. And but that's the thing is like I kind of wrote it from that perspective. Um, by the way, I'm just I don't know if anyone's like listening and not watching a YouTube, not watching the actual screen. So, <laughs> um, just Amina. I think it's Amina. I'm not sure how to pronounce. It. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um. We're saying that yeah the, the use of the word there in that context throws people but it's the funny one is that like there as a singular is like it's defined in the oxford english dictionary it has been defined since the the conjugations were invented and we just don't use them that way right sometimes and that we would you'd use it inherently if you were talking about someone you couldn't see outside you'd say it like if, if you saw a hooded figure standing outside your window right and then you told your wife and your wife comes back they would say are they still there so right. you would use it all the time. But when we read books and we read about military situations, for some reason, no soldier in the army is wearing a helmet. Or we just generically assume that every single person in the army is male, which allows us to use the pronoun he actively. But if you create a world where there is mixed armies, it doesn't make sense for it to be he. Um, so that's kind of the, the thought process I went on. I wanted to try to be true to how I was writing it. And another question. Who's the most difficult character to write and who is the easiest? Um, I, we were, I was talking about this a while ago. I think the most difficult character to write is actually Eric. Um, and the reason it is, is because you have two characters raised in the same way by the same person. And one of them has a POV and one of them doesn't. So trying to make sure that Eric is rich and complex is harder because he doesn't get as much page time and doesn't get as much direct page time. Um, so he's difficult to write in the fact that I want to make sure that he kind of gets that attention and the complexity. Whereas when I'm writing Dal and then because I have him as a POV, I'm able to do a lot more. So that is harder trying to make sure he gets as much time. Um, and is as rich a character. So he's, he's, he, that's very hard to write that way. And I think for me, the easiest to write is probably Dane or Belina. Um, I 
fucking love writing Belina. But to me, there's there's so much complexity that isn't shown yet with Belina, and the only times we see it are when she's alone with Dane, and we see it in the exile because there's so few people she trusts. Um, she has been scarred and burned so many times that there's so few people she really trusts. Um, and you can see her start to do a little bit of that with Dallin, but it's nothing like she has with Dane. Um, and she has the same sense of humor I have. And again, this comes back to we're talking about men and women and gender. And that's not a big thing that I deal with in the world. I try and deal with all that subtly um, because I want it to just be part of the world. There's a reason why you will never see rape in this world. It's because I created a fucking fantasy world. I do not want that to happen. Right. Like I get the chance to create a better world. Why would I not do it? Is my logic in it. And I know we got, oh, it's realism and it's this. And I'm like, okay. And there are books that have that. So if you want it, we can go to those books and that's fine. Um, but I don't tackle that sort of stuff a lot. But one of the things that I heard a while ago was someone didn't like Belina. And the whole point of Belina is some people will love her, some people will hate her. And I totally get that. Um, but because if a woman acts like she acts in the real world, people give out to her and people put her down and people hate her. And so Belina gets to act like that and gets away with it. Basically, she has the sense of humor. Uh, she has that sense of humor, but she also speaks it out loud like a guy gets to Right. And so that's part of that. And so, but I love doing that with her because she's so much fun to write, but you're also writing her knowing she's not just fun. She's incredibly fucking capable. Like she is really competent. Yes. You want something done and you, you get her to do it. It gets done. And so right. that's the kind of dynamic I like to play with because she's goofy. She's stupid. She's a sense of humor of a six year old. Um, but she's extremely competent and extremely proactive, uh, which is fun to write in a character. Yeah, I think it was, I want to say it was Ivan's POV. I'm not sure at this point, but it was talking yeah. about Dallin and Belina fighting and how like he couldn't even keep up with what they were doing. And this yeah. is someone who's also a master fighter. And yeah. just those two were a whirlwind, just like, out yeah. of this and world, good at what they do. That was during the, the attack on the refugee quarters, yeah. And, and that's like the... It's like when Ivan and Dallin have that sparring, they have a little bit of the fight, and Ivan yes. wins. But Ivan's saying to Dallin, he's like, we do this fight 99 more times and you win 99 times. Right. The only reason I won was because I was smarter. Right. Like I knew like what that, we were fighting for. You were... Yeah. You I were knew what you were doing and I knew how to trick you. always fight. Yeah. I wasn't fighting to win a fight. I was trying to win this fight based on the rules we set. Exactly. Dallin was fighting. Ivan was fighting Dallin. And, but now that he's already done that, he can't use it again and Dallin right. will win. So that's that kind yeah. of logic is you have a guy who knows how to win a fight, but he knows that Dallin has a talent and, a, and has been training to a point that he is way past him. Um, and Belina is there. You see Belina does those fights. She fights with Dane as well. Um, right. And even Dane is like, this one is amazing she's incredible at everything um right but obviously has a lot of flaws too and that that battle was kind of eye-opening to me for belina because most of what you see with belina before that it's not a big battle because she doesn't yeah. want to be in a big battle she's nope. too good to get in a big battle she's gonna win the easy way for exactly her, and which is that's the thing behind that's the subtle but character stuff that can. the fact that she let herself be there shows that she's starting to care for Dallin. Right. She let herself be there because she knew that if she wasn't there, he'd be dead. Right. And they'd all be dead. Right. And that's the kind of almost like a in my head, that's the Matt Couthon in her. That is the she's a hero, but she really fucking doesn't want to be. Right. Like, and she's going, fine, okay, if this is where we're going to have to die, let's do it quick. And, you know, <laughs> she wouldn't put herself in a situation. Usually, like, you see when her and Dallin are going through and they're trying to get to Ivan, and she has the three guards and how easily she deals with them without ever putting herself in danger. And that's kind of how she does it. And when she found Dane for the very first time, she knew exactly what to do to take this guy who she just watched 
She knows he's broken all the way into this fort, gone the whole way through, killed the commander of the fort, set him on fire, threw him off a fucking balcony, and then went for a drink and a bath. Right. She knows this guy is dangerous. Yeah. But she knows exactly how to get in and get to him without him even knowing who she is. Yep. Um, but in that scene with Dallin, she puts herself in the middle of the fight because she knows that the people in this place need her. And it's the subtle work that maybe you, you don't see if you're not looking for it. Like, I'm just going to say one of the things that I really do want to do at some stage is a, a Belina and Dane buddy cop trilogy. So I'd love to do some shorter books where you explore the period between the the start of the exile and A Blood and Fire in the gaps where they make all those stories, where all these things happen. It's something I would love to do. Um, and I, I do hope to do it at some stage. So that would be very fun. <laughs> yeah. See, I would abide by that. But I know people who do not like Belina. Um, <laughs> but I absolutely love Belina. And the one thing you will get is more Belina. Um, and she's the only character. I believe she is the only character who would get away with the ending where she meets Alina. And is able to say like almost break the fourth wall and say, oh, wow, our names are really similar. I'm going to call you Linny. Like, those other characters just would not get away with that. No. Not at all. And Helena and Dane are better than Wax and Wayne. I, I have not actually read them. I haven't read Mistborn. I read the first Mistborn book and I didn't actually, I only read like the first half. I didn't actually get into it. And not because I didn't like it. I think I was just in a weird reading mood. Um, so I have definitely haven't got. I know Wax and Wayne is meant to be the second era. Is it? I think it's yes, era two. Era two. Yeah. So I have all the Mistborn books. Um, and when I read The Way of Kings last year, I fucking loved it. Like my exposure to Brandon Sanderson was mostly Wheel of Time. Um, and it's really funny. Like I'm in this world where like I love Brandon Sanderson. I love what he does. I love his publishing mind. Um, and I love The Way of Kings when I read it last year. And I love his Wheel of Time. But I actually really haven't read that much. Well, for Wax and Wayne, just to give you a frame of reference, think Kaladin and the Lopin as best friends that do everything together. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what Wax and Wayne are. Obviously, yeah. slight differences, but that could be a good reference point. Okay, that's pretty cool. And Because that's what I see. Like, I would love to do like a, like a Belina and Dane buddy cop stuff. A Theron and Dan one. Um, they don't have any stories right now because we're seeing everything they have. Whereas, whereas Belina and Dane have stories. They have years right. of stuff in between. Like just in the exile alone, the gaps, the yeah. time jumps where they're together, like five years passes where they've done stuff. And then there's, there's years between like loads of, there's loads of different years where they have done loads of stuff that I have in my head. Um, and, and, like one of those, that scene with Dallin as well is one of the ones that I really like where um, Belina is running away and um, she's like, please help, help. And Dallin's like, oh, fuck no. What is this bitch doing? Like, he's like, oh my God, he's trying to kill me. And he's like, oh, Belina, please stop. And like, she's doing that sort of stuff. And I have this scene. This is not a spoiler, okay? This is just a scene that was in my head that I really want to happen, okay? And I'm going to write it. And it's not going to be in the main series. If I do, it'll be in the buddy cop one. And it, this is kind of the essence of what I want if I write a buddy cop series. And it was, I wanted Belina and Dane to travel to a different continent and have them try to go into a temple. And the temple, maybe in Carvos or something, a continent we haven't explored. And I want them to kind of go there and for the temple to say, you can't bring in any weapons. Okay, so they do the normal. It's like a take on the whole, I have too many weapons. You know that people right. always have that scene and Belina's had one of those scenes. And I want that to kind of happen. And then them to be like, do you have any more weapons? And for her to go, well, I could probably kill you with my shoe. And for the people then to go, okay, well, you need to give me your shoes. And she's kind of thinking to herself, she's like, I could kill you with this. I could kill you with this. And to kind of take everything. And she's like, honestly, I'm not good. I could kill you with this dress. And you go to the next scene and it kind of flashes forward. And it's just Dane standing there going, you had to fucking say it, didn't you? And Belina is just <laughs> book naked. And we don't describe any of the nakedness. We don't do any of that. Like, that's not how I write. 
But it's just that scene of him being like, you had to fucking say the dress. You had to say the dress, didn't you? And she is just there, like, having a great time being naked, not giving a shit. Because that's who she is. And he's just embarrassed because it's who he is. And those kind of scenes are the ones that I, I just love writing. I love writing that kind of dynamic. And I really want to write that series. So anyone who's looking for a Belina novella, you will probably get a Belina and Dane much longer than that at some stage. Well, that really led into this next comment about oh, yeah. <laughs> wanting to see other continents. Yep. So one, yes. So we already we see Valencia in in the ice. Um, we will see bits of the other continents in this uh, in the next two books. I do want to bring them in, but I don't want to fall into the trap where I end up writing so many side stories that the narrative gets bogged down. So I don't want to go too far out on them. Um, but we will, like you'll see with the ice, the ice alone already brings in other cultures, other nations that we haven't seen much of in the series. So we will see more of that. Um, how heavily we'll dig into the other continents in this particular series, because I've already kind of said I will be writing more series in the world. Um, I'm not 100% sure yet, it depends. And will we get a POV from the other elves? So we actually, I don't know if anyone's seen A War and Ruin. I think there's like a, I have like a hair here and it keeps, it, it's catching the light and shining, but I think it's like tissue paper or something. Um, just to let people know that I'm not just scratching my beard for no reason. But um, we do, I don't know, it is a bit of a spoiler depending on whether you've read A War and Ruin or not. Um, but there is an elven POV at the very end, the epilogue. Um, and so that is leading into it. Like, I think it's not really much of a spoiler. There, there will be some of that point of view in, in book four um, and probably going forwards as well. But yeah, that's something that's kind of been leaning into at the end of the third book. So going back to some of the questions I had, this might be another uh, raffo, but you seem to make a point of describing the color of the dragons and the sword mm. blades. We'll say, is there one thing I'll say is the dragons, there's no connection to any color. Okay. So the easiest distinction to make between the dragons is color. And that's, it's like anything, like any human, if they want to describe something, they describe the easiest descriptor for that person. So if they wanted to say, Hey, there's Ryan, they say, look at the tall guy over there. So that's what you'd use with a dragon. If they have obviously distinct colors, you'll use the color first. So that's, okay. that's a definite, that's an easy answer. And the soul blades. The soul blades, I cannot say anything. Okay. All right, let's see. I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, oh, how do dragons and riders pair up back before the fall? So it seemed like you needed to find the right dragon rider for the dragon. How did they go about that? So what I look at it as, I look at it as when people say, like, you meet the love of your life. I don't believe that there's one person for one person. I believe that you, there are, there are hundreds of people in the world. There's a world of billions of people. There are hundreds of people who you could meet and live happily ever after with. Okay. There's, there are hundreds of people who you could live a very happy life with, and hopefully you end up with one of them. Okay. So that's kind of the aspect that I take with the with the dragon eggs in that that dragon is kind of searching for a counterpoint to its soul. And there might be multiple people who have that counterpoint. Because I think if we always go for the searching for the one, you will have like uh, most dragon eggs will wait like fucking 5,000 years because what are the fucking chances right. that one soul will pass at that one point in time? It becomes a bit too much happenstance. So for me, it's like Kaelin... Kaelin's soul is a counterpoint to Valeris's, and Valeris can sense that. And it's the idea that, and even with the idea is that in Etheria, you'll see with 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 the ice as well. So the dragons, the whole the whole the mythology behind it with the dragons is that Varen, who's the father, took he created the dragons, and he took their fire away because they were too destructive, because they they couldn't tame themselves, they couldn't keep their anger in, they were too powerful. Um, and he did that by creating the bond. And then when they can find that counterpoint to their soul, that's what allows them to, to hatch and form a bond. And it's the, the tempering between the two people that forms a whole. And the Valation Dragons, this is a bit of a spoiler with the ice, so I'm not going to say anything about it actually, because just in case people haven't read the ice. 
um, but it might be slightly different. But the general is that they can still form a bond, just maybe don't have to. Right. Um, and it makes it easier uh, to work. Um, but yeah, that, and it's the same before the fall. And we, we go into a bit of it with Tivara when she explains the, the Cradle of Fire to Kayla when they go in. This is just one place that was just people were brought. There was other right. places where eggs are kept. But this is a specific place on Dracaldrir. Um, and in this place, they used to bring people to go and come around the eggs and, and hope that something would happen. Um, and that there are. There are hundreds of opportunities, if not thousands, depending on the person or the egg, where that might be the case. Um, and like anyone, everyone's unique. Maybe one soul has less counterpoints than another. So there right. might only be five or six people that it could potentially bond with. But... It just depends. Still, those percentages of crossing that right person at the right time are astronomically small. So I think when it comes down to if someone started saying it was only one for one, you would never find it. It doesn't make right. sense from probability. But yeah, that's that's how it works in my head. But I suppose that's kind of what matters because I'm the author, isn't it? <laughs> right. Was there any type of like qualification of had to be more of a highborn citizen or anything like that? Just so. Kind of in, 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 in the past, the in, in the past, I think it kind of depended. Like, I think they, they they did have a bit more of a criteria, but then as dragons stopped hatching, it was like just get anyone the fuck here, right? And that's gonna be yeah. That that's a talk. I don't want to get too. I'm I'm tripping over my words because I don't want to spoil anything, and um, especially for future books so i will kind of halt a bit on that there um but no not it's not very much like only noble can come and do this that's not really how they how they how they worked it okay um and i don't think this would ever happen but could a person have rejected the dragon like the dragon's like oh that's someone i want to bond with and the person's like mm, nah that's not the life for me or just I the think... fact that they feel that way would disqualify them in the dragon's mind. Kind of that one. So in a way, yes. So in a way they can reject them. Um, but it's one of those things where if they've chosen this person, the person is not the person who'd reject them. Right. That's kind of the thing. Like, um, So yes, they could, and but that would stop the dragon from hatching at all. Is that kind of idea. I'm sure there's a loophole and um, if I dig deep into the into the history and the lore in my head and kind of go I'm sure there's a way we could make a dragon come out and, and not do that um but in general the way it's it's built and the way Varen would have created this is it's not really so much the dragon choosing the person it's more like a soul searching a soul right. and if that soul doesn't bond with that soul they wouldn't hatch for them is the general idea and just also high black rose <laughs> glad you found the series um if you can't tell since i have ryan on here it is one of my favorites so you should enjoy it uh let's see so with the spark so anyone who can touch the spark not just dragon riders they live a long time yes. naturally Yes. Obviously and it, getting killed. It's not an it's not an immortal life, so they will die of old age eventually. Um whereas the Knights of Acheron is immortality. Right. So while you have that sigil, you will not die of old age. You will not age. Um so theoretically they could live for thousands of years. But yeah, anyone who can touch the spark is a very, very prolonged life, but it's not indefinite. So my question I think my main question is, was it common Again, going back before the yeah. fall, when draw lades and people not people touching the spark were more common at that time. Yeah. Was it common for them to have families, or were they or children it, it, specifically? Yeah, it, it would have been. And um, the thing with it is, is all that also be higher turnover. And I'm going to use the word turnover because there was a lot more. What people forget is you have the empire, who's just like overreaching maybe the evil empire okay right but the reality is all out continental war was relatively stopped over the 400 years that they were there you know because 
they did achieve a relative peace, except there right. would be loads of wars were happening between the High Lords in the South. But in the North, you know, they kind of had a bit of a chill time. So, and, and they've been kind of harvesting children with the ability to touch the spark from the South. So a lot of that is coming North. So a lot of the people in the South actually don't see a lot of magic, whereas you're seeing a lot more of it in the North. Right. In the past, loads of these battle mages and stuff would have went to war and they would have died. Um, so their turnover, not a lot of them would have lived to see all those centuries. And some of them would have, and you'd see like, uh, like sects of people who, um, like, like craft mages and stuff who would have lived for longer periods of time, who wouldn't have been in wars. And like, it's like anything, like you look at a society, I, they would have mostly kind of had children within their own selves. So the craft mages, a mage would have been with a mage solely for the fact not because they're looking down on people but solely for the fact that they understand that otherwise they're just going to watch their loved one die and right. there was other people who didn't care about that and that's kind of part of the dynamic of it that's that's people's choice like i'm gonna love someone because i love them and i'm gonna be with them and um, but you're gonna have to watch that person die um or you keep your pool within other mages and hopefully you don't well you will eventually yeah. but you know not in the same way but that's even what then struggled it... with 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 um with Naya is right. that he, he he was always going to lose her and it's why he didn't he didn't seek anything after that because he knew he was always on the run he was never going to find or chances are he wasn't going to find someone who had the same kind of long life as he did and he didn't want to just get attached to someone just to watch them die again right and now that's something he gets the he thinks about it a few times in the series with his children oh, it's always there for that, him like and it's there it's the yeah the whole the whole like the how ephemeral life is is a is a big thing for him. He's understanding that, and that's where it's touched on very very early with the ice as well. Is when he comes back and to him, he hasn't been away very long. But to like, but to Arthur, like he hasn't seen one of his friends in a long time. Right. And Aeson's like, oh, that's nothing. He's like, yeah, to you, right? It's like, yeah, a few years is a long time for us. Uh... Yeah. For those of us who haven't been alive for over 400 years. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of time. Um, yeah, so this should be a fairly easy one. Do you ever hear anyone say anything in real life and th yeah. then think, I got to include that in my story? I need oh, to yeah. get this sentence in somehow. So I never am. Um, one thing I don't do, if someone criticizes characters or wants things changed, I don't care. So that's like, if I let that happen, then I would continuously change stories to what other people wanted. So I, I just ignore it. I literally take it and set it on fire. Um, it's just, it's not useful to me, but it's great that people do it. So like if people are critiquing character or they hate a character, that's kind of the point. Like if I'm not drawing a strong emotion from you, whether it's a good or a bad one, then I'm probably doing a bad job. So I'm happy that you hate that character because that's, that's a good thing. It's, it means you're actually invested. But I'm not going to change the character because you hate them. But if I'm like in the Discord or somewhere else and people are like, oh, wouldn't this be cool? I sometimes I might sit there and go, yes, that would be very fucking cool. And I'm absolutely going to do something similar to that. Yeah. Um, or even like, for instance, I did see one before. One of the first reviews that came up for Blood and Fire was actually about Belina. Um, and they used her to say how pointless my descriptions were because I spent so long describing a character that meant nothing to the series. And I was like, she was already coming back, but bitch, you wait. Like, as in, no matter what happens, this person's going to be, even if Blina wasn't going to be as big a character as she is, she's going to be goddamn integral now. You know, one thing I have learned since reading fantasy is if the author provides a name to a bard, you pay yeah. attention to that bard. <laughs> Their story is not done. Hundred percent, but it's like anything. Like you gotta pay attention. If if you if the author is good at their craft, pay attention to anything they spend extra time on. So maybe not. And actually, the only place that wouldn't apply is maybe Robert Jordan, because then every single chair <laughs> would be a main character. Yeah. Um. But in general, it's a reasonably good advice to pay attention to what the author focuses on because it's probably going to mean something. All right. Uh, let's see. Getting towards the end, uh, are we going to see any Death Stalkers in the series? So this is a funny one because 
they there was whole scenes for them written into both books two and book three yeah. and they are to this day the only scenes i've ever cut from any part of the series <laughs> so and actually both of those scenes were never cut they were just reworked and where the depth stalkers weren't there anymore and it's just weird how it's worked because <laughs> it's nothing to do with the depth stalkers not working it's it didn't fit in that scene and what i was focusing on got lost and it was just really annoying so yes i really 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 want them in the series i have planned on having them in the series they've meant to have been there twice already <laughs> and they had to be pulled out so in the scene in vindicore where they um discover the the city and um, there was originally depth stalkers there that was the original um part and i had to tweak that for for different purposes right um and actually we nearly saw calendar finding them um and then that got taken away as well so they're the only scenes that have really had structural <laughs> big structural changes and they both got removed um okay. that is just pure coincidence um but yes i very much unless it becomes such a running joke that i can't put them in <laughs> right. um but i do want to um leather leaf trees must be really important or is it chittering squirrels i'm not gonna lie i don't know what that means <laughs> that's probably a I reference was assuming I'm it was wheel of time reference of most likely <laughs> anything the author pays attention to that's, that's what i mean one of the only authors you cannot apply that advice to is robert jordan yeah because yeah. he lingers on everything yep robert jordan yeah yeah <laughs> all right so these next questions are could potentially be a little bit spoilery. They're more focused on events that happen in the series. Okay, well, um, what we'll do is we'll say anyone listening now or anyone listening back from this point on, even though we've already dropped a few spoilers, but from this point we, on, we have. it is very definitively spoilery unless you are up to date with the series. Yeah. yeah. And now we're, we're, we're kind of covered. So make sure people know Perfect. that we have a 10 second gap for you to close your ears. You know, um, but you can ask the question and then we'll, yeah, we'll fire away and see. So this first one isn't even that bad. It's just in the series, it constantly references this many years after Doom. Yes. Are we going to get like a, a story or a big explanation of what happened at year zero? So I've debated it. Um... But one of the things that I've learned, um, especially after doing some panels over in the US at Dragon Con, uh, one of the things that Tolkien was a master of is knowing when to leave gaps. Okay? And the reason it is is because once you explain a mystery, it's no longer intriguing. Right. So I, I definitely do not want to explain all of the things we haven't seen. And it's why I was very careful with the ice and why it was a story I really wanted to tell but I needed to tell it right because the magic of it is not knowing. And so if you then know, maybe that doesn't live up to your expectation. So right. I have contemplated it and it might happen. I know what it is and it might happen, but I have to really think on it and think of how it would fit into the narrative structure. Um, one way something similar to it could happen is in one of Kalen's dreams. So that's a way to fit it in. It might happen, it might not, but at the minute I really actually am unsure as to whether I'm going to include it. Yeah. And just for that reason, because sometimes not knowing is more magical than knowing. That makes sense. Um, I can't remember which author it was. I'm actually leaning towards that it's Rothfuss, who definitely has his own problems. But one of the things he said, and I it could be someone else was readers think they want answers to everything, yes. but they really don't. You yes. don't want to get all the answers in the final book. Exactly. It removes you want, the mystery. And for the narrative me, thread should close. Yeah. Like your narrative thread should close, but yeah, there needs to be those things unanswered. And when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the Lightbringer series where I felt he created all these mysteries and then he kind of answered everything. And yeah. a lot of people complain about the ending of Lightbringer. And 
there's a few reasons for it, but I think that's one of them that he did provide too many answers. So that makes yes. perfect sense. Yes, if you look at you stuff, know. look at Star Wars, look at Anakin, look at Obi Wan, look at look at Tolkien, look at Robert Jordan. All the things that keeps a fandom alive, all the things that connect a community, are debating over what really happened. Right. Is is it's the it's it's like the write your own story part of the series where the fandom can read and try and imagine what would happen that's the fun is trying to because even us right now when we look back how are the pyramids made we don't know the craziest questions in in real life are the things that we don't know the answer to and if somebody then turns around and goes like like i said oh the pyramids are made you know because uh, they used to just like roll bricks of stone on logs and put water on the sand to firm it up all of a sudden the aliens disappear and it's not as fun right and you know it yeah it holds through from fiction to the reality so yeah it's it's hard to know yeah real life isn't like that absolutely and things can feel rushed yep um yep. okay and hi alicia Let's see so of war and ruin we get a lot more we get a lot more fights between dragons than we have yes, at any other point. And I'll just say it in this way. Does Asen know the number of dragon riders that the Order still have? How many members of the Dragon Guard are still there? When you say the Dragon Guard, because you, like, you said the Order and then you said the Dragon Guard. So... Yeah, I, does he know the number of like people on like like Eltwar and Pelinor yes. and Laina and uh, yeah yeah he know he knows who's there. Okay, and that's a yeah. pretty small number now. If I'm if my it is and right. actually if you do the maths is done at the very end, um when Rocca is doing some bits and there's actually a little bit of a hint in the numbers too, so if you if you look at the numbers they'll answer some questions depending on okay. what question you're thinking of. So yeah, that's all I'm going to get into that because, yeah. again, that's very recent. Um, so we already mentioned the fall and some of the draw lades from the fall that survived the battle and yes. such as Aeson. And then later on, they become Rakina. Yeah. Are those stories, are you going to tell more of those stories? Specifically, the one I'm most interested in is Asen and Farda, since they're two of the main characters. Yeah. So, yeah, we've, we've seen little bits of that, and there will be more of that. Um, okay. In regards to flashback versions of it, I have contemplated small things. Because um, you'll see, like, in in a blood and fire the first one of the first things that farda says to asin is um you escape me at the fall you escape me in, you know you escape me in ilnane okay and we know that they've seen each other after then right okay um but that was when because obviously again this is a spoiler i know people because it's live people are coming in after we've already said it's spoilery um so like we know that Aeson killed Farda's dragon. Right. Right. So we know that Aeson and Farda have met since after since since then. But it was more like you escape me at El Nain, because El Nain was the real chance that Farda had to kill him. Um is kind of where that comes from. And so I have contemplated telling that story um in like a short story version or something. Um but obviously now that they're in the same place um moving forward in the book there's going to be more on that yeah topics um, conversations then, are going to happen <laughs> yeah and it's kind of like there are other rakina in the world who are not in our story because it's like people criticized when you know, star wars starts bringing all these jedi into the new canon and they're like oh it's all the jedi were dead and they're like no, it was unrealistic to believe that they all fucking died like right. it's a galaxy full of them and um, so they're going to be hiding so like in this not every Drale, not every Rakina is the same. There's going to be people who lost everything, managed to live, and don't want to fight. 
So a lot of them ended up in, in Alora, um, but the ones who were really, there's, there's going to be in my head, in, in the history, there's ones who left, ones who went to, to Narvona, ones who went to Carval, ones who, ones who left the place and they, they're, not, they're not fighters anymore. Right. They don't want to fight. They're done. Like, yep. So that's, an, that's another part of it too. Yeah, there's the one that you meet that is like, no, I haven't talked to them in 100 yeah. years. I've, I've lived here. I am done it's fighting. One of those things not... that, it's one of those things that always got me about, because this is, this is a trope in itself. So the fall of an ancient order is a trope in itself. And it's a trope that is, is very much loved. Um, but one flaw that I've always had in loads of the things that I saw is how, how there always ends up only being one left. The, always, only right. one. And like that doesn't make like sense probability wise. Um, so for me, that's why like we have quite a few of the Dragon Guard are still alive. There's we, we learn more as we go through the series and see who is actually still alive, who's there. But like one of the things that um that I thought was true, I hated the Obi Wan Kenobi uh, show. I lo- I loved some of the moments in it; they were beautiful. But I just didn't like the slapstick nature they made with it. Um, and then some of the moments were very serious, and I loved them. But one of the things that it did really well is showing that like the human nature of people every jedi didn't just go let's all band together and start a war again they all experience things differently and um, i think that's really important from a character perspective of the fall of these kind of things being able to, to see it <laughs> let's just say that that's that's a read and find out and you won't be waiting too long um so yeah that will come back up. Let's see. Um, unless I'm mistaken, because again, big series, big world. I may have forgotten yeah. details. We've really only seen two of the seven gods kind of directly be involved. Yes. And in what's going on in the world right now? Yeah. Are the other five going to take a more active role? At that some is point. uh that's a read and find out that's what i thought yeah um, okay and this is my last question so okay. right around the two hour mark so perfect has to do with the ice okay so i won't get into specifics well no we can unless... so what we'll say now is this question is so if someone's live or someone's come back this is spoiler question if you have not read the ice um close your ears so yep. Yeah, that's a, a general one because it if it just yeah because it's it's fun to ask the question that people who have read the ice then can 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 listen. Yeah, as far as I can remember, this is your first like true humanoid species that you've created that we haven't seen in any other series. Like, yeah, you're probably true. Like we have some like there's bits so you have like the the jotnar and you have the angan but they would draw from little bits of different things right so like the jotnar come from like the jotun of old norse giant legend um they have their own mythology here but drawn reasonably well from that and we shapeshifters are well known even though like the angan in their own form here are unique species and race right but their general stuff is pretty like it's it's been it's been done before yeah but so in the are, yeah. ice, uh, so what can you tell us about this new species? Like, where do they come from? Like, in your mind, like actually creating them, not their history and the story. Like, oh what, yeah, but like, did you draw on anything or? Honestly, no, um, I didn't, um, and that was really cool. Because this was, I'm sure there'll be someone who can pull out some reference from some material 200 years ago that has someone look something like this. But for me, this was completely, I wanted to create these guys. I want. I had a history in mind already. Um, I wanted this, like, it, it made sense to me to have these guys there. And I wanted to create something unique in how they interact with the world and how and uh, show that there's more than one we've already seen little bits with druidic magic but show that there's more than one form of magic in this world and there's different mm-hmm. things manifesting in different ways um and i just i don't know i was like i want i want these guys to feel alien um but also grounded which is a weird kind of contradiction um and you'll see what like felix's art piece that he did for it he captured it so well um that that face is just that little bit not human 
um, which is what I wanted. I wanted them to feel distinct. I didn't want them to just be like, like in Star Trek, basically every alien species is just a human with a strange thing on their face. Um, right. I wanted it to be different. I wanted to have those kind of like double hinged, powerful legs they use for leaping across the crevasses. I wanted to find a way that, you know, they interact with their environment and how their magic is being completely attuned to um, the tacticum, which is the heart glass that's there and they use it for everything. And so it was something that um, I had a lot of fun making and coming up with the concept in my head of what they would look like. Uh, so yeah, I'll... I think anyone who has read of Warren Ruin and read the ice would be mad to think that they wouldn't come up is my general answer. So like you see, like, especially we see Rocca and what he, where he is at the, at the end. And then you're reading the ice and, uh, some of the stuff that comes up in the ice and how heavily involved they are with that. Right. Um, and what is cool is this is one of the things that I'm leading to where I will do something in book four that will make you go back all the way through book one and two and three and see that it's kind of been there the whole time that this, these druids aren't just coming out of nowhere right. that this has been here and um, so yeah i'm looking forward to to like getting into that a bit more and seeing more of it and we even even actually kaylin's father's whole story like which has been there from the very start and right. um, you already know from the very first book that theron has a relationship with kaylin's dad um, and then we find out that that has to do with with druids and with everything else so like this kind of shows it's been there from the start anyway but yes um, and I've already kind of said to kind of few people, um, maybe haven't announced it fully properly, but when this series is finished, the next series in the world um, will be going back about 3,000 years to when the humans first arrived in Aferia. So that's the next series is when they arrive and what they bring with them are their druid armies, are the druidic gods. We see, I've already kind of said this in my Discord, we'll see that, and it's the, we get to see the formation of the Knights of Acheron, we get to see the the, the Order when it's only 300 years old. Um, so that's that's something I'm really excited to do, because like it has a lot of familiarity to what we're doing now, but it's a totally new story, um, with loads of new concepts and aspects, and you're dealing with factions in, in forms that we're not used to seeing them in. Um, so that's something I can't wait to do. Um, so which is actually way more of an answer than you probably expected from from that one. But yes, I think it's safe to assume the druids might pop their head up every now and again. Do the elves have their own drawlade and KOA? So these are actually answered. Um, so one well, we know the elves have drawlade because those of the drawlade are elves. So Eltwar himself is a is a drawlade. Um, so yeah, like there's all those different species that have already bonded. Um, one of the things that we know, um, being a barrier to being a dralid is you have to have, your species has to have the ability to touch the spark. Um, cause that's what facilitates the bond of the souls, which is the reason why, um, the Urax, uh, haven't bonded because they can't touch the spark and the dwarves haven't bonded because they can't touch the spark. And that's explained that the god who created them in their mythology, Hephaesir, didn't give them the spark because he didn't want them to have to be involved with that, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't bond. And then with the Knights of Acheron, that's also explained as well. So they're talking, who is it now? I can't remember the exact conversation, but I believe it is... I believe it's Ruan talking to Arden. Um, and he's talking about the, the Knights of Acheron. I could be wrong with who the conversation is, but I think that's who it is. And they're basically saying the reason there's only humans in the Knights of Acheron is because of the code they have to follow. So the elves, for instance, couldn't be part of the Knights of Acheron because their own moral code and their sense of honor would lead them to do things that are very different to what they might need to do with the Knights of Acheron. Um, and it's just that idea and you'll see a lot more of it. I need to go back and look at the conversation because it, it's, it, it's better explained um, in that than when I go back and no one I'm trying to explain it now, but there is a very solid reason. Like, no, there are no Knights of Acheron. No, none of the other species are members of the Knights of Acheron um, for very specific reasons. 
Um, but it is detailed in that conversation, but I don't want to trip myself up and say the wrong thing because I know I've explained it quite well in that one. Um, I could probably find it reasonably soon if I took a, a go through it, but probably not soon enough to say it on this one. But it is explained. It's actually in the books explained between Ruan and um, Arden. Like, I'm pretty sure it's between those two, but it definitely happens. Mm. Yeah, so that's another one. The shamans only use blood magic. Um, and then it's also explained that anyone can use blood magic. Um, but it's like anything. Like Those who have the information and power don't like to spread it around. Um, but it is it is talked about where if someone tries to use blood magic without the um, without using a, a gemstone or without using a vessel that it can kind of it's kind of like trying to use an electrical current with your hand instead of putting it into a battery first um, and that's very much was it what it is like you can't charge your remote by sticking your finger in the plug socket and your finger in the in the remote control you have to put a battery in and um, so anyone can use it but if they try and do it without a vessel and they are going to burn themselves out like almost immediately and um, depending on how powerful they are but um yeah so that that's how they how they get about was using blood magic instead of using the spark and that was one of my biggest reveals that i was so excited to do was the reveal for the backstory for orax and um how they function in a society and it's right. not just these nameless orcs that you just want to kill it is actually a functional right. reason behind why they do what they do yeah, that that was definitely a big one. Or I was like, oh, yeah, you know what? You, you was, don't need to hate them. It's like you you understand them now. It's like well, the, the concept is also is that I don't want to completely alleviate it. So they are a warlike culture. All right, there's multiple reasons why. Yeah, they could just go and kill pigs and horses and stuff and try and fill the vessels with the life essence of those animals. But you also have there's a there's like a proportional quantity of essence um, for complexity of an organic substance. So, you know, you, you'll get more of life essence from a human than you will from a, a turtle or a, or a pigeon. One from mass and size, one from longevity of life, because, you know, it needs to sustain you for a longer period of time. So your life essence, a human that can live to 100 years will give more life essence than a mayfly who dies after a day. Um, so there's all that, but then they're also, they're a warlike culture. It's what they've always been. Um, and so one of the easiest avenues for them to collect that is war because, you know, it's a lot easier to kill all these people in, in war and even harvest the essence of your own lost, your own dead, um, than having to like, I don't know, farm 200,000 pigs. So there's logistics in that. And it's the idea that they're not fully not accountable. Like they, they're also happy to kill shit. But so are humans. Right. Humans go to war. Humans war all the time over stupid shit. Yep. Um, but it's just more the, the idea of bringing it back that these guys aren't just like... Because I wanted to introduce them as as the Cannon Father, as the Stormtroopers, as the Orcs and the Urukai, um, but separate it and be like, you know what? No, we're not just killing nameless, ridiculous creatures. These are an intelligent species that speak with a different language than what we speak with and they have reasons why they do what they do. Um but it doesn't make it justified. Like you're still fucking murdering hundreds of thousands right. of people. They're still, they're still attacking humans. They're still going to war with them. There's just a bit more of a morality and a reason behind it than just blind right. arg, let's kill things. And I lied. I did skip some <laughs> questions <laughs> earlier because uh, <laughs> we, I was trying to keep the questions based on where the conversation was going. Yeah. Um, and these aren't really specific to the series, but it's something that I'm always interested in. How do you come up with the names for characters? Uh, so at, at the start, I kind of talked about it a lot with myself and I kind of typed them down. And I, but I think now it, it's way more natural. And um, I think now that the characters and the nations have their own cultures, that the names come to me reasonably quickly. There could be yeah 100 percent. I, I realized i just jumped over because i saw i don't know again if someone's not watching the screen a question came up and um, could there conceivably be a tribe of peaceful orax if they decided to just sacrifice livestock yeah there, there could be 100 percent um the chances are they'd just be killed by the other orax um but it's like anything like you're you're changing a culture like and it can happen in the same way that you go to 1970s 1950s catholic ireland and um, i'm sure there are atheists but like 
it's a big deal to try and separate yourself from that whole culture because they're, these guys are intelligent. They're, they're completely sentient beings. So like they could do that. Um, but the chances of it happening are probably pretty slim. But conceivably, yeah, 100%. Okay. Um, how did you come up with the old tongue and what was the reasoning behind having the old tongue? Well, how did I come up with it? Well, actually, the reason, the well, reason first off, the reason because I wanted it. That's, it also made sense to have different languages. Um, that's how societies and cultures evolve. Um, different languages, blended languages. Um, like English isn't the same now as what it used to be. It's affected by, by different languages. Like we use words like restaurant, which is French, and um, rendezvous. Loads of different words are, are brought in uh, all the time, influenced by other cultures and languages. And um, that was the thing for me, was that before the humans arrived and while the dwarves kind of kept a lot of themselves sheltered, that there was a, a common language between... The old tongue used to be the common tongue. It was the common language between the, the elves and dwarves. And as new cultures arrived with different languages and they formed ways to communicate and thousands of years passed, not just hundreds of years, thousands of years passed. And languages amalgamate and languages change and right. um i'm sure there's a linguist and anthropologist there who will tell me i've done that in the wrong way but sure look um that was something that i wanted to do and then forming it from a linguistic perspective it was kind of taking the root of words from old norse danish and a few other bits and kind of finding the aesthetic that i wanted um, and i kind of cheat in the way that i conjugate it in a in a pretty similar way to english and um, so it flows easier and people can understand it easier because otherwise i'd have to like yeah i'm not a linguist so for me to like form a full language like root stem conjugation everything from the ground up would be like its own lifelong thing like token was right. a linguist by tra by like education by degree right. um so like i don't have everything in the language completely flawlessly planned out but i do have like conjugations and numbers and you know, all that sort of stuff and it's there and it's ready and I can draw and create sentences when I need to and I can understand it when I read it and there's that sort of stuff. But it's something that if you wanted to really turn it into this, something like, even like Dothraki in Game of Thrones wasn't a fully fleshed language until when they made the series, they had a linguist actually come in and make it a language. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the kind of thing. Like if I wanted to make that a fully fledged, completely usable language from all areas, I'd have to have a linguist work on it. Um, but based on how I create the words and use the roots and stuff, if people asked me for sentences, I could create them and right. create them off what's already there. And we had one guy who, um, which was amazing, which was um, a US, I think it was a Marine. He was a canine trainer in the Marines. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked me for commands for teaching his dog to like sit and stay and heal and that sort of stuff. And so I, I was able to get those commands and some of them I already had. Uh, and I was able to get a, give them to him and he was training his own personal service dog mm -hmm. and that's very cool. So, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. That was awesome. That was very cool. That was like a real special mm -hmm. moment for me. If my dog was it already nine years old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not going to try to retrain her. Uh, let's see. Did I get it? Just to conclude that topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then this is kind of an opportunity for you to almost like brag about being a good author. Yeah. But are there things that you've added to the story or to the series that aren't necessarily meant to be noticed, but are there oh. to like enhance the story, like shading on a, drawing like you don't necessarily notice the shading itself but it makes the rest of the drawing pop. oh that's that's the craft of writing so that's in everything and it's but half the stuff we've talked about on this is that right. is the small subtle nuances in character and reaction and like with belina like how her being there in that scene to someone who is just reading the book is just a character being there but if you're examining Belina and examining what she does and how she is able to get out of Dodge really quickly and how she is, like she knows what the hell she's doing. She's one, of, she's one of the most competent characters in the entire series. And I'll say that very easily. Like she, she messes up a lot less than any of the others. 
Like, if you go back through the series, you are not going to find many places she made mistakes. Um, whereas you'll find all the other ones making a lot of them. So if she is somewhere, she is there on purpose. And so the sort the sultan that shading is that like the last place she needs to be is in the refugee quarters in Beld uh, with the Beldwaran refugees with aggressive dwarven armies honing down on them. We know she can get in and out. Like she does not need yep. to be there. Right. She makes an active decision to be there and she sings for them and she tells them stories and that's a part where I think a lot of people might not see how we're seeing the vulnerable side of Belina, how we're seeing the heroic side of Belina, in that she's not heroic for fighting for them, she's heroic literally for being there, trying to give them something to care for at a time like that. Um, and that's a big thing for me is, hi Andrew, but it's, um, that is very much those things that people don't need to notice. Um, but when you go and you reread and you understand who Belina's character is, you understand that her simply being there is a choice and that she has made the choice to be there for Dallin and made the choice to be there for those people. And that shows a heroic side to her that if you're not analyzing it, you probably wouldn't see. Um, and you have to have the understanding that she has every opportunity to not be there. And in every other situation, she wouldn't be there. Yeah. Another tiny thing that i never noticed until you actually mentioned it on the discord was how eric will say father and mother yeah. but kaylin i think says mom and dad yeah and it's just where they grew up it's like it's exactly it's one of those tiny things that shows that they have a different they came from a different place so the, the Western villages in Ilianara to me come with more of a, a Celtic culture influence. And in in Celtic Ireland, like mom and dad and ma and da are what we would have used like long before I was born. So it's not anachronistic. Or people nowadays and people in the States and other places will say mom and dad and they'll think it's anachronistic because they're now using it in um, like a fantasy setting. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's those differences. And it's like with the ice, like you were saying, like that 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 little link um, where we talk about Darth Vastian and his one line, literally one line, that they're going to go and see him because he's the person who has a cart for them. And he's just arranging a shipment. Right. The shipment he's arranging is the shipment Kaelin is bringing. The cart he's talking about is the cart that um, they escaped in. And then you understand that Aeson's dad has been sending weapons through Darth Vastian to the north and is actually the weapons that are arriving with Corrin. And Caelan's dad has been supporting the rebellion from the very start of the series without us ever even knowing. Even when he left, even when he wasn't fighting anymore, he was secretly helping. And right. you will know none of that unless you pay attention to that one line. And so it's those kind of things I like, I'll stick that in there and I'm like, I hope someone notices it. Maybe I'm being too uh, obtuse <laughs> with this and maybe no one will notice. Um, so when, and a few people had noticed and it, it's, it, that's really nice for me because it means people are like, you know, really kind of digging into it. And right. you, a lot of it, you'll probably only ever see on a reread. So the first time you see, you read the ice, you might not see that. <laughs> so what we do is one of my friends, um, whenever he's pissed off at his parents, he calls them by their first names and they hate it. Yeah. Okay, Mick. They're like, what the hell did you just call me? <laughs> but um, yeah. Okay, so I had thought of a couple others, but they've already they've left my mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's all I have. So yeah, so like if I'll anyone is there, for like another we... two minutes if there's any more questions. Yeah, if there's anyone has your questions, chance I'll to answer them. Yeah. Um, I will say, uh, Kaylin's dad. That was hard that um i'm guessing you know what i'm talking about yeah. um w wish wish we saw more of him um but i am glad at one point you do you do explain that there was more going on in that scene than you initially see yeah 
Well, that's one of the one of the things and one of the stuff you need to to look at as well is because you'll see him in the ice and you see who he is and what he can do. But oh, Andrew, thank you. Um, one of the things, one of the small points that we're talking about, almost like the shading, is that might leave you to go, well, how the hell was he killed so easily? How did that happen so easily? What well, happens because we're so used to seeing magic and the spark, we don't understand how much of an advantage it gives someone. This guy was known as one of the greatest swordsmen in the entire continent, but someone like Rendell could literally just hold him still. Right. And he could do nothing about it. And it brings the line full circle to me when he's like, put a sword in my hand and we'll see. And Rendell's just like, why would I be such a fucking idiot as put a sword in your hand? Right. I'm just going to kill you. And, you know, that's that kind of contrast between someone who looks at it from a noble perspective and someone who's like, I'm not being an idiot. And you realize then as well, it shows that if he had have put a sword in his hand, you know, things would be different. If if he hadn't have given Caelan his sword, um, if there's loads of different scenarios there, but it, it just shows a person trying to di- live a different life as well. Um, see, I just bought a Warren Ruin. I'm so excited. Thank you. Do the novellas impact the main books enough that you should read them in order? Personally, so if I'm going to ask anyone, if anyone asked me that question, I would say, for the novellas, I'm not going to answer The Fall in the Blood and Fire because people will kill me. They can be read in any <laughs> order. But after that, for me, the most satisfying way to read the series is in publication order after that. So if you want to get the intended impact, I would read Of Darkness and Light, The Exile, Of War and Ruin, The Ice. Um, you can read them in different orders, but because of the way reveals work, they will impact things differently. So right. different character scenes will have different emotions if you read them in different orders, read the books in different orders, because I, writ- I wrote them in a way that should control how you are feeling about the characters. But for instance, if you read the ice before War and Ruin, you will have a different opinion of Aeson when he's making decisions in the War and Ruin. You can do it, but your your journey as a reader will be different. So someone who reads of War and Ruin first will go through a War and Ruin, see Aeson's, Aeson's decisions, make a judgment on Aeson's decisions, and then they'll read the ice and they'll have to have their judgment challenged. Someone who reads the ice will get an opinion of Aeson and then then they'll challenge that opinion of Aeson when it comes to his uh, decisions. So I would read them in publication order if you want to read them in the way that I intended them to be read. But I think it's very legitimate. You could technically, and people will go nuts, you could technically read all of the main books and then read all of the novellas. You could do that. You could read them in almost any order. It's kind of how I've written them. Um, But changing the order will impact... Um, the emotions you feel when you read certain other stories. Yeah, like I've mentioned earlier that there's people that have like waffled with Of Blood and Fire and then they look at how yeah. big Of Darkness and Light is and then they see Of War and Ruin and they're like, I don't know if I want to get into that. For those people, that's I part of what say, the fall is pick up for. the exile. Pick up the exile. <laughs> if, if you've read The Fall and Of Blood and Fire and you're not sure if you want to continue, just read this one more novella. And even <laughs> and though it's best after of Darkness and Light, you yeah, can, you can read, read it before, before Darkness and Light. Chronologically, yeah. it comes before. Uh, yeah. And, and it's written so in a way that it definitely could be read before of Darkness and Light. Yep. Um, it, I think sometimes reading of Darkness and Light beforehand gives you an investment as Dane as a character in Dane as a character to allow you to give that room for reading a novella about him. Um, but it could be read in that way too. Yeah, 100%. Like there, there's been times I've wanted to recommend The Exile as a standalone. Like, oh, hey, you have yeah. time for just 50,000 words and that's it? Read The Exile. It, it I doesn't don't matter know many if you've read people, anything else. It's that good. I don't know many people who've gotten to of Darkness and Light and who kind of like... The read-through from of Darkness and Light to of War and Ruin is very, very, very strong. So most people who give the second book a chance if it's in their wheelhouse if it's stuff that they if you read on blood and fire and you hated it you are not gonna like the series if you've read blood and fire and you liked it but maybe stuff was like a little bit too similar to other series like because they're trying to hit the tropes in the genre then a darkness and light usually hits the sweet spot for people then afterwards because that's where it starts to kind of 
diverge towards what was intended. But again, someone, someone might read A Darkness and Light and still like the series, and that is totally fine too, because you shouldn't be giving time to a series that doesn't give you joy, because reading at the end of it is for joy, and some of us get a bit too caught up in what it is to be a reviewer, and it is to be in a community, and at the end of the day, if you are not having fun reading your books, then what is the point? Right. Advent yes. And winter is yes, it will. Awesome. I was very excited. And you're talking about Kalen's, Kalen's dad, and that is my short story that's going to be in the Advent of Winter, which I cannot wait to do. Is called "The Blood That Burns the Winter Snow," and that is from Vara's point of view. Nice. So that is something I'm really excited for people to see, and um, I think it shows a lot. So. Just take all your money. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they don't take all your money because I kind of prefer that people who read my books can also eat food. All right. See, this is going back to the novellas. I would read them in order. Yeah. Uh, usually don't like prequel novellas, but all the novellas, yeah. And they're all you gotta, very different as well. You got to be very careful when you write those styles of book. Very, very careful because it's always hard to create tension when the outcome is already known. But I think something that impacted me a lot was when I was hearing, I can't remember who it was now, I was just watching an interview and they were talking about Superman and they're saying how hard it is to create tension in a story where the lead character is impervious to everything. Yes. So what you do is you try and hurt the things that he cares for. Um, and that's what creates tension. And so the tension for me in the ice isn't about whether someone will die it's about the emotional roller coaster Asin is on. And that it's not just a struggle with his loss for someone else, it's a struggle with his loss of humanity, it's a struggle with his loss of hope, it's a struggle with his loss of the people he's, the loss of mental health as he's dealing with what he has already lost. Um, and that to me creates the tension because also you know people are going to die and you start to see that he's not this unfeeling machine that he does care for the people that die. He just can't afford to stop. So every character that dies impacts him. So when, you, when you're reading that, like that's part of the tension, um, is knowing that with every loss, his weight is heavier. And like for me, those kind of things are what's important when you write prequel novellas because there needs to be something else that drives it. Like, like when in the fall with Elvira, we know if we've read A Blood and Fire, what happens in the fall? Or we have a general idea. But the tension is in watching who will betray her, watching how people act, her sense of loss as the world falls around her. Like, and, and it's the diving into the tension. You know what happens in the fall, like when we lose, we lose her, we lose Vildrar and the tension there is in not the loss of the, of the order, not the fall of the order, not in the fire and the hell and everything else. It is in her individual unique breaking of her soul. And that's, that creates a tension on that scene. Like I had nothing to do with the fall. You know what happens. They fall. It like, it's, you know that they're not there. And in fire. So the, the tension is in, in, is in watching Elvira's heartbreak. see speaking of the fall very close so this is a real funny one because we've gotten loads of messages being like why isn't it released why isn't it released why isn't it released and it, it's really funny because it's not released it's because the last time we got loads of complaints because we sold it and then it was delayed because when we we're dealing with the printers we'd be like okay it's going to press great and then the printer would like five weeks later be like oh hey we forgot to tell you five weeks ago but there was a small problem so we didn't print and we're like what and then that happened three times. So what we tried to do this time is we tried to put the pressure on ourselves and not on the not on, not on the reader, not on the customer. We didn't want someone who bought the book to have to have their delay after they've given money away. So we wanted to take it on ourselves and go through all of this. And then once the book has actually gone to press and once we know they're literally printing the pages, then We'll put so it's ready like the whole thing's ready and um, we're just waiting for the small little pieces with the printers getting everything in line and then going into printing and making the printing blocks 
once that's done, then we're going to put it on sale. But we just want to make sure we take the weight and the delays off of you guys and we'll keep it ourselves. So, so. Mm -hmm. I know that's an abstract term, but hopefully very soon. Right. Uh, so something I was going to mention earlier when we were talking about relationships. So this isn't a yeah. question, just a statement that I recently read, I think it was the Lycanius trilogy. And I mentioned that I like the characters in there. And I've talked to a couple other reviewers and they're all like, the characters were the weak spot in that series. That like everything else was great, but the characters I didn't connect with. And my response to them was, it wasn't so much the characters that I was interested in. It was the relationships between the characters. Yeah. And that's a hundred percent because of reading the bond and the broken that I'm more focused on looking at relationships between characters and not just personal growth. And I think it's also where you can see, depending on how, how it works. So you can see the strength of character work because you can have a great relationship between two characters, okay. but where you know there's strong character work is when that character has totally different relationships with multiple other characters who have different relationship with multiple other characters. Right. And the concept is that, like, say if you take four characters from the Lancanius trilogy, right, and you have each of them have the same conversation about the same topic, that might be challenging, a challenging right. conversation. Would all of those outcomes be very different? And that's kind of one of the things for me that I really like to focus on. And I love, you'll see in like Game of Thrones, which I think is a masterwork in characters, like to a point that it's just on a pedestal you can't reach. I cannot think of any two characters in Game of Thrones who have the same outcome from the same conversation. Like, you know, even take like today's political topics and have Cersei debate with um, Tyrion on abortion and then have Cersei debate with Jaime on abortion and then have Tyrion debate with uh, Daenerys on abortion and then have Daenerys debate with Jon Snow. There is no conversation ending the same way. Right. Like you take a hard topic, an emotional topic, and you put that with those characters. If all of their conversations are coming out very differently or like the path they take on that conversation is very different, that's great character work. Because right. it means you're able to think that those characters will think differently. Yeah. Like and that, that to me is like a really, really good character work. Right. Yep. All right. Well, we haven't gotten any more questions, and I am actually out of questions at this point. Sweet. So well, you got do good two and a half hours. Yeah. <laughs> and I ignored the ones that were obviously going to be uh, read and find out. Like, yeah. I thought there was a chance I would slip it in there, but there's a few. I got asked some questions, and it's like um, I got asked a question recently. I think I saw. I don't think I've actually answered it because. I've recently just gotten so many like messages on social media that they kind of my ability to answer slows down a lot. And especially cause like I'm living a life too. So it's like the weekend. So I was away doing right. stuff. Um, also I think someone was asking me like, Oh, um, this is a spoiler for a war and ruin. If anyone hasn't, um, seen a war and ruin or read a war and ruin, but they're asked about the Dane moment, um, where Dane has his soul blade and they're like, can you explain to me why he has this and why it's why it's white and why it has a spear? And I'm like, there are so much read and find, so many read and find outs in that one question. There is no way for me to answer that. Like that, that's in the next book. <laughs> right. right. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Michael. So yeah. Yeah, that was great fun. I thank you so much for having me on. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining and thanks everyone for watching. If you haven't, I'm assuming everyone here has checked out the series at this point, but if you haven't, pick it up. Whether you have or you haven't, I'm happy you're here. So, Right. All right. See you all later. All right. See you guys. Thanks so much.